Good afternoon and welcome to the Appellate Division First Department. I will commence with the call of the calendar. Council, please pay attention for your names, uh, for your case. People versus Segunda Gumps. Council Darren, for Appellant. Darren Blio, on behalf of the Appellant. Good afternoon. You've been granted six and two. Council Thank for you. Respondent. Beth Cublin for Respondent, Bronx District Attorney's Office. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You've been granted six minutes. State Farm versus Sergi Corps of New Jersey. Council for Appellant. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Stuart Bodoff for State Farm. Good afternoon, Mr. Bodoff. You've been granted three minutes and your respondent sought no time. Thank Santulo you. versus Chen. Council for Appellant. Good afternoon, Irina Zamyatin for the appellant. Good afternoon, Ms. Zamyatin. You've been granted five and one. Respondent. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Damon Velarde from Silver and Kelmachter for the respondents. Good afternoon, Mr. Velarde. You've been granted five minutes. Tobola versus 123 Washington. Counsel for appellant. Uh, Brian Isaac for plaintiff appellant. Good afternoon, Mr. Isaac. You've been granted four and one. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Evie Kazansky, respondent? Evie Kazansky for the defendant uh, respondent's appellants. Good afternoon, counsel. You've been granted four minutes. Thank you. Forgive me. People versus Jose Carrion is uh, submitted. Kind Operations versus AUA Private. Counsel for appellant. I believe we have a pro hoc vici application. I'll hear from New York Council. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Adam Slutsky from Goodwin Proctor for the Pell and Kine. Um, David Zimmer, also from Goodwin Proctor, is on. And he's, all, he's been admitted pro hoc vici in connection with this appeal. And with the court's permission, Mr. Zimmer will present argument this afternoon. Thank you, Council. That application is granted. Mr. Zimmer, you've been granted five and one. Respondent? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Daniel Green of Vetter Price for the respondents. Good afternoon, sir. You've been granted five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Fieger versus Ray Enterprises. Counsel Good for RJ Group and Ferguson. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Robert Leno. Good afternoon, Mr. Leno. You've been granted five and one. Counsel for Schneider and Ray Enterprises. Respondents Council, if you're speaking, unmute. One more time, Council for Respondent Schneider Ray Enterprises. Okay, I heard her during the uh, pre-answer, so uh, hopefully she will respond when the case is called. Uh, Kutri versus Wolf. Uh, counsel for respondent. Uh, hello, you have Kieran Corcoran here for petitioner Saro Kutri from Stinson LLP. Great. Good afternoon, sir. And you have been granted four and one. Thank counsel you. for respondent. Good afternoon, Philip Bowman for respondents. Hello, Mr. Bowman. You've been granted four minutes. Uh, People versus Brandon Simmons. Counsel for appellant. Good afternoon, Jody Ratner for appellant. Good afternoon, Ms. Ratner. You've been granted five and one. Thank you. Respondents Council. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. Samuel Goldfine for the people. Good afternoon, sir. You've been granted five minutes. Thank people you. People be Dijon Melendez, Council for Appellant. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Lois on for Appellant. And you've been granted five and one as well. Uh, Council for Respondent. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Diana Lewis for the respondent, uh, the Bronx District Attorney's Office. Uh, you've been granted five minutes. Good afternoon. Alloy Advisory versus 503 West, 33rd Street. Counsel for Appellant. Good afternoon, Your Honor. This is Paul Montclair for the appellant. And you've been granted five and one. Counsel Thank for you. respondent. George Richardson of Sullivan and Worcester on behalf of the respondent. Good afternoon. You've been granted five minutes. Uh, People versus Anthony 
uh, Tirado is uh, submitted. Reddish versus Adler. Counsel for Dr. Adler. Uh, Gregory Casino of Martin Clearwater and Bell for the Adler defendants. Uh, good afternoon. You've been granted five and two. Uh, counsel for Dr. Ahmed. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Seth Weinberg for Dr. Ahmed. And you've been granted five and two. Counsel for St. Barnabas Hospital. Good afternoon, Your Honor. William Buckley of Garberini and Shear for the appellant St. Barnabas Hospital. And you've been granted three and one. Counsel for respondent. Uh, Brian Isaac for the plaintiff respondent, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Isaac. You've been granted 10 minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Wells Fargo versus Aegean USA et al. Now, this has nine counsels, so give me a moment because I have a separate sheet just for you guys. Okay, let's start. Uh, Aegean, and I may be pronouncing that wrong, USA. Uh, yes. I believe there is a, a Pro Hoc Vici application. Mr. Warner, I will hear you. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Ken Warner for the institutional investors. We're the attorneys of record. With me on the call <clears throat> is David Sheeran of the Texas firm of Gibbs and Bruns National Council for the Institutional Investors. And with the court's permission, Mr. Sheeran will present the oral argument. Thank you, sir. That application is uh, granted, Mr. Sheeran. Uh, welcome, and you've been granted seven minutes. Uh, Your Honor, may he have five and two since he's going to be testifying first, and he then would He'll have be arguing I, first. I mean, I'm sorry. We'll be arguing, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be arguing first. Yes, I, I, I am going to say this. I am not going to grant uh, responsive time to every single appellant on this case. So, uh, and I want to warn all counsel uh, that uh, I, in the two hours before your case is heard, I would like counsel to confer with each other and make sure that there are not repetitious arguments amongst you because I will cut that off, okay? So if you can streamline your arguments uh, so that we are not hearing the same argument from each appellant, that would be most appreciated by this court, okay? So I will permit someone on the part of the appellants to have rebuttal time, and I will let you gentlemen decide who that is, okay? So I will grant the five and two here, unless when I call the case, I hear otherwise, all right? Thank you very much, Your Honor. Very well. Thank okay. you, Your Honor. American General Life Council, Mr. Reed. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Kevin Reed Good. for the IG parties. Good afternoon, and you have six minutes, sir. Thank U.S. You. Bank. Like, if, if Your Honor would, would allow it, I would like to use one of my time for rebuttal to whomever. I, as I allow. said, you can all discuss. I am not going to have all five of you rebut. Uh, I'm understood, just not Your Honor. Have it. No, understood. My my I, my understanding was that you were going to allow one of us to do it. Right. Like so, the, so you can all discuss it because I've already granted five and two to the first one. So if you all want to discuss how you rebut, I am fine with that and we can discuss it again at the call. But again, these issues are pretty streamlined. They're dense and they are complex, but they seem to overlap. Okay, so I really urge you after the call of this case to connect with one another and discuss how you want to go forward with the argument. All right. Understood. But I just, will just, hear about who's going to do the rebuttal at the actual call again. All right. All right, Your Honor. Just so that I'm clear, and we're all clear, your 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 intent is that we will have two total minutes of rebuttal. Yes. Okay. Thank you. U.S. Bank. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. It's Danielle Rose from Cobra and Kim on behalf of U.S. Bank in its capacity as indenture trustee for the HBK NIM Trusts. Okay. Good afternoon, Ms. Rose. And you have five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Tilden Park. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jonathan Hockman for Tilden Park. Good afternoon, uh, Your Honor. sir, and you have seven minutes. Uh, Your Honor, I did hear what you were saying about rebuttal, and I would uh, ask if we could have uh, 
two minutes of our own rebuttal because I am not our... going to repeat myself. You gentlemen can talk to each other after the call of this calendar. I'm not going to repeat myself with everyone. No, oh, I un understood. We are seven recently. minutes. Thank uh, you, I'm honest. back, Mr. Ricardo. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Henry Good Ricardo, Patterson Dell, after I'm back. Good afternoon. You have five minutes. Thank you. Now going to the respondents. Uh, DW Partners, I understand there is a Pro Hoc Vici application as to this client. Yes, Your Honor. My name is David Greenberger from the law firm of Bailey Duquette PC. Good afternoon to you and to the court. Um, uh, I'm honored on behalf of DW Partners and Ellington Management Group to introduce to the court my colleague Isaac Gradman of the state of California, who is admitted Pro Hoc on November 20th, 2020, and with the court's permission. Mr. Gradman will be uh, handling oral argument on behalf of our clients. Very well, Mr. Gradman, welcome. And you have been granted six minutes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. GMO opportunistic. Mr. Good afternoon. Mr. Sorry, Mr. good Stern. afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, Joshua Sturm from Davis Polk and Wardell on behalf of the GMO funds, as we'll, we'll call them for simplicity. Okay, good afternoon, sir. You've been granted six minutes. Thank you. Nover Ventures. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Robert Chief of McCool Smith for Nova Ventures. Good afternoon. And my apologies to you. I misunderstood. I thought that the, uh, you had withdrawn your entire appeal, which is why I initially denied you time. But I'm glad we cleared that up. You've been granted seven minutes. Oliphant Fund. I'm glad too. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, Your Honor. Diana Connor of Patterson Belknap on behalf of the Oliphant Fund. And the same thing happened with you. My apologies to you, and you've been granted five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Uh, Jenna versus Kempner. Uh, Klempner is a submit. And Downtown New Yorkers versus City of New York. I'll, uh, respondent? Respondent, City of New York. I'm Janet Zalian. Oh, I'm sorry. OK, I, I took it out hey, of order. Colin, you have four yeah. minutes. Uh, uh, appellant. Michael Hiller, Hiller PC on behalf of downtown New Yorkers. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I did that somewhat out of order, but you've been given four and one. And the uh, uh, second respondent uh, interveners, Mr. Mastro. Yes, Your Honor. A pleasure to appear before you. Good afternoon, sir. And you've been granted four minutes. Uh, and as you heard earlier, uh, you will be the second to the last case heard, as Wells Fargo will be uh, called after your case. Now, hearing the first case on the calendar, People v. Segundo Gums, uh, Appellant's Counsel. Counsel, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Darren Polio, in association with the Office of the Appellate Defender, on behalf of Mr. Secunda Gums. Mr. Gums did not receive a fair trial on the simple question of whether he knowingly possessed weapons found in his cohabited apartment. The most serious issue below was allowing the state to introduce an unconstitutionally obtained confession in violation of Mr. Gums' Miranda rights and in violation of clear Supreme Court precedent. Well, that statement had been suppressed after the Huntley hearing, was it not? That's correct, Your Honor. And it was a uh, so that the admission of that statement followed what the court considered to be the opening of the door. Why was that uh, uh, call by the judge incorrect? Uh, two points, Your Honor. First, the Supreme Court is clear that this statement could only be introduced to contradict a testifying defendant. It was not admissible on any opening the door theory. Separately, we also argue- I I'm sorry, I don't understand that. Uh, Your if Honor- If the defendant the takes the stand and a statement that was made during his arrest or following his arrest is suppressed and they take the stand and say something, that uh, uh, that would, in the eyes of the uh, court, perpetrate a uh, some sort of uh, uh, fraud on the on the jury and leave a misimpression. 
uh, that would certainly be allowable. Why is that not the case here? Here, Your Honor, the statement was not introduced to contradict Mr. I need you Mr. to raise Jones. your voice. I, I'm oh. having a hard time hearing you. I, I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, here, the statement was not introduced to contradict Mr. Gum's testimony. It was introduced during the prosecution's case in chief. And this is completely barred uh, by the Supreme Court's decision in James v. Illinois. That decision directly controls this case. In it, the Supreme Court held and New York has uh, since affirmed the rule in James that unconstitutionally obtained statements such as Mr. Gum's unmirandized confession can only be introduced to contra uh, specifically contradict a testifying defendant. They are not admissible on opening the door theory through any other witness's testimony. And here, the harm was uh, here, the state has to show that the error was harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. They simply cannot do so. It, for the simple and hopefully straightforward reason that this, is, this was a confession. This, uh, this was a statement that the police extracted from Mr. Gums while he was lying face down on the floor of his apartment, handcuffed behind his back, surrounded by officers who had just broken into his apartment moments before pursuant to a no knock warrant. The court properly suppressed the statement. It should have never been introduced. Uh, and its prejudice uh, was, was significant. Okay. Your Honors, I would also like to address uh, for a moment the drug-related evidence uh, that came in in this case. Following the statement's introduction and Mr. Uh, Mr. Gums being forced to take the stand, a whole slew of prejudicial drug-related evidence came in in a case where the only question was knowing possession of weapons. Who, who forced found in your the client? Uh, this is Judge Mazzarella. Yeah. Who forced your client to take the stand? Your Honor, once the confession was improperly introduced, uh, Mr. Gums uh, was in effect required to take the stand. And in our brief, we identify five separate statements from defense counsel, including during his opening statement, that the defendant would not testify. The act of introducing this unconstitutionally obtained confession changed the tenor of the entire trial. The people's introduction of all of the drug-related evidence was problematic uh, for three reasons. First, it was so prejudicial and so disconnected from the crimes charge that it should have never reached the jury. Right. It was also introduced in clear violation of the collateral evidence bar. Uh, finally, and it bears it bears emphasizing both of those points. Uh, both of those points are true, even if this court believes the door was opened to the drug-related evidence, which Mr. Gums also disputes. So the court may not reach the issue of whether the door was opened. Well, didn't it, he uh, testify that there were only three bags of marijuana, making it seem like it was, you know, a, a small amount and just, you know, personal use kind of <laughs> quantity? And, and that was far from the truth. Yeah. Uh, two points, Your Honor. First, he, he did not suggest to the jury that this was only for personal use. No, In but fact, he did say it was just three bags. Uh, yes, Your Honor, and there's some and confusion. And there were a lot more than three bags. There's some confusion in the record, Your Honor. There were what three confusion? containers. What confusion? He said there were three. Are we agreed on that? He, he, he did say that, Your Honor, yes. Okay, and, um, and they recovered over 137 or something like that? 136 yes. plastic bags. So three minus 136, uh, he was about 133 bags short. Yes, Your Honor. I was only suggesting that there was other testimony and evidence uh, that there. So what, what, but I, I explain to me why, if a defendant takes the stand and affirmatively lies on the stand about what was in his house and what was recovered by, by the police, you're saying the district attorney's office doesn't have the right to to rebut that evidence? Uh, your Honor, the, just, the state's obligation was to show uh, that the statement was incomplete and misleading, and as this uh, as this court held in People v. Schlesinger, that the suppressed evidence was reasonably necessary to correct yeah, the misleading know, impression. 
Councillor, you know, what the people introduced here wasn't just the statement that he made that they originally suppressed. There was a proffer uh, session here, and he made certain statements at the proffer session that he then denied, and that those statements were admitted. Those statements were not suppressible. Mm. Uh, a couple of points, Your Honor. First, those statements uh, were suppressed in pretrial, and the state agreed that those statements were not uh, were not usable. They only came in following Mr. Gums taking the stand, uh, which again was a result of the improper uh, improper introduction of the confession in the first place. So those statements would have never been properly before the jury. Um, it also um, the relevant question is still whether we can say beyond a reasonable doubt that the introduction of the confession had no effect on the jury, and the state simply can't show that here. All right, you'll have two minutes on rebuttal. Thank Ms. You, Cutlin, Your you're up. May it please the court, Beth Cublin for the Bronx District Attorney's Office. Good afternoon. Um, in response to counsel's points, um, the defendant here sought to benefit from the court's initial preclusion orders um, and use that to his advantage in then either soliciting information during cross-examination during the people's case or later testifying um, to things that were misleading um, and that therefore the people um, that were entitled to correct and the court properly in its discretion held that the people um, were permitted to do that. With respect first to the hallway statement, um, the council seeks to limit the scope of analysis simply to um, an impeachment framework when what we're looking at here is an opening the door framework. Even in Mullins, the third department case. Can you address his arguments that uh, that the court allowed improperly for the suppressed st statement to come in in your case in chief. Is that accurate? Your Honor, that's not accurate, Your Honor, because the cases to which defendant on which defendant relies are strictly impeachment cases. And in those cases, they say that on Miranda's statements under an impeachment exception cannot come in on the people's case in chief. However, um, the, the uh, opening the door exception is a separate exception to the exclusionary rule. Um, even Mullins, um, uh, counsel, which defendant- um, Counsel, this is Judge Owen. Yes. I think my understanding of his argument was that the opening of the door was not out of this defendant's testimony, but it was opening the door on the people's case in chief. And I believe the argument was that's not permissible. I think that's what he's trying to say, right? He's saying that it didn't come from the defendants to open a door, but it came from the people's witnesses Therefore, there was no opening of the door. I think that's what he was arguing, correct? I believe so, Your Honor. And, yeah, but and I don't think that, yeah, but I don't think the case law supports that argument because I'm looking at a case now, People versus Reed, by the Court of Appeals, 19 New York 3rd, 382. And that's opening of a door from a prosecution's witness. It has nothing to do with the defendant testifying. Correct, Your Honor. And in addition, uh, People v. Coley, which is the third department case to which um, the trial court cited, um, in that case, although it was an ineffective assistance of counsel case, factually, there also the court held that on the people's case in chief, the door had been opened by cross-examination uh, right. of a detective um, on the people's case in chief. So yet yeah, that case also um, specifically holds um, that that door can be open during the people's case in chief, specifically to unmirandized statements. Well, on cross-examination, if defense counsel opens the door, that's what happens. Obviously, the people can't open the door. Correct. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with regard next to the drug evidence, um, the here the court um, did not simply wholesale admit all of the drug evidence off the bat. Um, these were incremental decisions that were made as the door continued to be open um, to uh, the, the various evidence. And the court only allowed certain evidence in um, on the case in chief, then stated that it would reserve um, further rulings um, to see what um, had occurred in the testimony. And it was only subsequently when the defendant um, 
essentially lied um, during his testimony that the court held that the door had been open to additional evidence. Um, and uh, counsel, what, what was the warrant issued for? To find what? The warrant, the, the, the no knock oh. warrant. What, what, what were the police anticipating locating? The no knock warrant, Your Honor. C certainly for the evidence of the guns. Um, I am not sure whether that warrant was also um, in search of, of the drug evidence. Thank you. Um, okay. However, certainly the drug evidence um, became relevant as it was part of the circumstances surrounding the execution of the warrant. And defendant is the one that brought this into question um, by creating these misleading impressions of what actually had um, gone on in, the, in that execution of the warrant. Thank you so much. Okay, counsel, you have two minutes on rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, James v. Illinois controls this case, and it is very clear that there are, are very limited circumstances when an unconstitutionally obtained statement can be used. The court foreclosed it. Counsel, am I, counsel, this is Judge Joyner. Was I correct in, in framing your argument that because the opening of the door came in on the people's case, that there was no opening of the door at all, and they can only be opened on the defense case? Uh, Your Honor, I would only adjust that slightly in the sense okay. that uh, the question of whether the door was opened is not really the issue. The issue is that the statement can only be used to contradict a defendant's testimony. Right, it but cannot... this, right, but in this case, the defense counsel on cross-examination of Adams, the police officer, mm -hmm got a statement out there that arguably was not an accurate statement so that you can't just leave that hanging there without a response to it, right? I, it, actually, Your Honor, and this is why James is very instructive, this right, the defendant's constitutional right is so important that the well, Supreme Court has said I, that I, can't I got that case, but how do you, but how does that, how you, how do you reconcile that with Peaceful versus Reed by the Court of, by our Court of Appeals? Yes. So read, Your Honor, is a confrontation clause case. So it's not dealing with the exclusionary rule, which is the entire, uh, which is the constitutional rule, which is motivating this. It is specifically the incentives around police investigation and the improper obtaining of evidence uh, that motivate the exclusionary rule. So Reed uh, is dealing with slightly di different circumstances. Uh, and I believe the Supreme Court just branded cert uh, to review a decision which expressly relied on uh, Reed to approve opening the door. Um, so the Supreme Court will be addressing that uh, very quickly. Thank you on so people much. You're out of time, sir. And I want to thank you on behalf of the court for your pro bono service on this matter. Please thank the, the firm uh, and I thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Your Honor. State Farm versus Sergi Corps of New Jersey, Mr. Bodo. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You may proceed. Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Stuart Bodoff of Rifkin Radler, appellate counsel for plaintiff appellant State Farm. It is State Farm's position that the Supreme Court incorrectly denied its motion for a default judgment in part against certain defendants, those who had defaulted. Uh, State Farm demonstrated proof of service, proof of the facts constituting its claim, and proof of the default. Um, with respect to Marcellus's failure to appear for the EUOs, State Farm demonstrated mailing of the two EUO request letters before it received a claim uh, and demonstrated his failure to appear. Under MAP free against Manu, that's, uh, the timing requirements are not in play here. Uh, the Supreme Court incorrectly found that the NF2, which is not a verification or claim form, was the triggering, uh, I guess, claim form, even though it's, it's not a claim form. Um, so I think that's where the Supreme Court got it wrong on, on that issue. Uh, but again, even if that is taken as a verification form, State Farm was only six days late, um, and that doesn't invalidate the requests under uh, 11 NYCRR section 3.8L. Um, just with respect to the cause of action based on stage loss, uh, contrary to the Supreme Court's conclusion, Ms. Whiteside's affidavit uh, was sufficient 
to establish the, the facts of the claim. Um, she was assigned to this claim. She was the custodian of the claim documents. She was she stated or uh, under oath, she, had she was fully familiar with the facts based on personal handling and a review of the claim file. Um, given that this was a default judgment motion, that was sufficient uh, to establish the, the facts or reasonable inferences on the stage loss. Um, if the court has no questions, I, I would rest on my brief. Thank you so much. Thank Have you, Have a great day. Pasquale Santulo versus Tony K. Chen, DDS. Counsel for appellant, Ms. Zam Yetten. Yes, I don't know if I absolutely. pronounced it correctly. If I didn't, my apologies. You have no, five and enough. one. You may proceed. <laughs> Thank you very much. May it please the court, Irina Zamyatin with Furman, Kornfeld and Brennan for the appellants, Dr. Chen and Dr. Chen PC. Your honors, it is our position that the lower court uh, improperly dismissed our motion for summary judgment as plaintiff's counsel failed to demonstrate that Dr. Chen was the proximate cause of any injuries to the decedent, and furthermore, failed to demonstrate that Dr. Chen breached the standard of care. Well, so turning- Well, well Dr. Dr. Chen, uh, if I'm correct, uh, first saw the uh, decedent on um, the 4th uh, of June, is it? Yes, you're correct, Your Honor. And at that point, he discovered something that he thought was a lesion or could be a lesion, but he didn't make any uh, referral for any further treatment. Is that correct? Correct, Your Honor. Surgeon? On the first visit, he did not because he noticed that she had immediate complaints of pain behind 213. So he immediately addressed that by performing a root canal. Now, right. within a few weeks, the patient came back for further treatment of that tooth, and he immediately refer, uh, referred her for treatment with a periodontist. Now, well, isn't it plaintiff's expert's position that that failure to uh, refer the patient on that June 4 visit uh, was a departure? Um, Your Honors, while they state that they there's a failure to immediately refer, there is no argument that that 11-day delay caused any injury to the patient. Therefore, we move on to the next date, which is June 15th, which during that specific appointment, a referral was immediately made as soon as Dr. Chen addressed the patient's immediate area of concern, which I, I was causing her pain. Uh, I, I misread something. I thought the plaintiff's expert uh, said that the lesion had advanced from a T1 to a T2 between those two visits, and uh, that, that was a approximate cause of some injury to the plaintiff. No, Your Honors. Actually, they don't specify specifically as to when <coughs> the lesion advanced. They say that originally when it was measured behind teeth eight and nine, the lesion was, based on their opinion, a T1. And then they say that eventually it transformed to T2. They can't say with any definitive proof or certainty that it advanced during that one appointment. And regardless, they can't say that it advanced at the end because a physician who saw the patient in March of 2013 said that it was still, in fact, a T1. Well, so did, there, didn't, didn't the plaintiff's expert also um, uh, uh, opine that Dr. Chen should have um, referred her to an oral surgeon specifically for a biopsy and not necessarily to a periodontist. And that was also a, um, a departure on, on Dr. Chen's behalf. Um, they do assert that, yes. However, the reason that they say that is they say that an oral surgeon can biopsy a lesion. And they say that a failure uh, to refer, that's their departure. They say that a periodontist didn't seem urgent <laughs> enough. That is not by any means the same as saying that that was a departure from the standard of care. It is their opinion that it is urgent. That is absolutely not the same standard. And there's no question, and they do not dispute, that a periodontist can, in fact, biopsy a lesion. And Although this periodontist that he would that Dr. Chen referred him to, in fact, I think said he he did not do that or he could not do that. Uh, he specifically, 
He specifically, Dr. Silverbrand, informed Dr. Chen that he was referring the patient to someone else to do that. Now, we can't speculate as to why he did that. However, the record is clear that within five days of seeing the patient, uh, the periodontist referred her to an oral surgeon, the biopsy was done, and she received her diagnosis. Therefore, but the fact no of the matter is, the counsel, the, the fact of the matter is that the, the that the plaintiff's expert did not state specifically that periodontists do not biopsy, do not do biopsies. That's that's what you're. That's the argument, right? I mean, so Dr. Chen would not have known that the periodontist he referred the patient to would not be able to do that. You're, yes. Thank you, Your Honor. That is correct because specifically, Dr. Chen testified that he used this periodontist regularly and he knew that this periodontist conducted biopsies and he sent the patient to Dr. Silverbrand for the express purpose of taking a biopsy of the lesion. And if I may, Your Honors, I will move on to the proximate cause argument. Well, why don't you do that during your uh, rebuttal time? Because we're out of your uh, <laughs> time in chief, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Velarde, you have five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, Your Honors. Good afternoon. Uh, Damon Velarde with the law firm of Silver and Kelmactor for the plaintiff's respondents. Um, <clears throat> the, the departure that the plaintiff's expert finds here goes a little bit deeper than just you should have immediately referred the patient to an oral surgeon, one who specializes in biopsies and excision of a, of a tumor of this type rather than a periodontist who, who merely treats for gum disease and things like that. The departure runs deeper because the office chart for Dr. Chen makes no mention of the purpose of the referral to the periodontitis, uh, the periodontist, uh, other than uh, you know that that it's for the purpose of a biopsy and to evaluate the the, the tumor itself. Furthermore, there's four appointments at this office where no mention at all is made of the tumor, and there's no mention that uh, you know asking the patient whether she's seen the periodontist yet or reminding her to see the periodontist. What we have here is self-serving deposition testimony from Dr. Chen saying that he must have done that. He must have uh, uh, reminded her to see the periodontist. And that must mean that the lesion was still present in the mouth during that time period. But what, what the problem with that is, is that Ms. Santulo is deceased. She didn't have the opportunity to testify otherwise. The only evidence that there is of what the purpose of the periodontist referral was is his self-serving testimony and office. Counsel, and counsel office this chart. is Judge Oink. I have a quick question. Is Dr. Yeah. Chen the only, is he the only defendant left in this case or all the other defendants are, have, been, have been dismissed? Uh, well, I don't know that the, uh, that the other defendants have been dismissed. The, the, Dr. Chen is the target defendant in this case. I understand. I'm just one, I'm just, my question is, are there any other defendants? Yeah, there are other defendants, Your Honor. Uh, there, there is Mount Sinai Hospital and two other doctors. Um, I, I don't, you know, really know much about that part of the case. It's not an issue on appeal here. Uh, uh, I was just curious. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And the, the, the delay is, is a six-month delay. And to go to the point of proximate cause, the lesion at the time of first presentment is two centimeters large. It's the size of two teeth. So wasn't the two centimeter size was sort of just on, it could have been a T1 or it could have been a T2. Um, it, it seems to be interpreted different ways by different experts at the, at the two centimeter size. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Our, the plaintiff's expert says that two centimeters is the upper limit of a T1. Defendant's expert says that's the lower limit of a T2. That's a dispute in fact, but really the dispute in fact comes from the amount that the tumor grew while the patient was seeing Dr. Chen. At the beginning, it was two centimeters behind two teeth. By November, when it was diagnosed as cancer, it was behind six teeth, six centimeters. We have a triple growth of that lesion. And with that, obviously there's a more invasive surgery. To put it simply, 
there's a larger hole in the patient's mouth because there's a larger tumor to carve out. You know, uh, it's it, it's it's that simple in terms of proximate cause. Um, the the delay between the diagnosis and the surgery itself, that's pointed out by the appellant in this case. Uh, what what they are pointing out is the potential for some comparative negligence on the part of the plaintiff. That's for a jury to decide. That does not negate the fact that there was a six month or approximately six month delay between first presentment and uh, diagnosis while she was treating with Dr. Chen. And, and the, the thing, the, the important part here is that the defendant is deceased. She was never able to contest the testimony of Dr. Chen at his deposition. She will be, the plaintiffs will be entitled to a noseworthy charge at trial. And the question of fact really comes down to what Dr. Chen says was the purpose of the periodontal referral and what his actual office chart says, which is nothing about why Thank you, he Thank you so much. Referral. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank All you, right, Honor. counsel, you've got one minute. Okay, I'll try to be quick. So uh, to establish a uh, motion for summary judgment, you need both a departure and proximate cause, not just one. So for purposes of proximate cause, the plaintiff's expert needs to plead with specificity, not conclusory language, as to what changed as a result of this alleged delay. Our expert, an oral surgeon. Well, but didn't their expert say, as Mr. Velarde just indicated, that there was a, a very significant growth in the tumor from the time when it was first seen on her first visit till the time when she was actually diagnosed with cancer? I mean, yes. that's part of the proximate cause. How could that not be? Because that's cause? not enough. Just because there was growth does not mean that treatment changed. And our expert specifically says that between June, December, or where she underwent treatment in May 2013, the size of the resection did not change. The type of treatment did not change. She did not need chemotherapy. She did not need radiation. The resection. But the plaint I mean, I know that's what your expert says, but doesn't the plaintiff's expert say something different? And when we have diff a, a battle between the experts, isn't that a classic situation where we deny summary judgment and see what happens at trial? Not when the plaintiff's expert does not give you spe specific examples of how the treatment changed. So this court in GL versus Horowitz, a 2017 case, had an expert who opined that treatment would have been different and less invasive had a benign or a tumor been seen earlier. This court opined that that was not enough because the language was speculative and conclusory. And just saying better outcome, less invasive, these are just empty words that don't suggest how the treatment could have been different. So if you do not satisfy proximate cause with specificity, which their expert specifically does not have, they cannot defeat a motion for summary judgment. And that is Thank exactly you. what we have here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ebola versus 123 Washington. Counsel for Appellant, Mr. Isaac, you're up four minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Brian Isaac, I represent the plaintiff, uh, Appellant Cross Respondent, and I'm sure you'll be happy to know I'm going to try to go under my time. Uh, we have a video. Oh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do it. We have a video here that speaks very clearly to what happened. We have still photographs. There's no question that the fabulosa cleaning material was just thrown on the floor. There was no wet, there were no signs there. There were they, there were signs all the way to the left, but there were no signs in the immediate. Uh, I guess in this case, Fabuloso was not Fabuloso. Oh, that, <laughs> <laughs> that's certainly true. We have testimony from Ms. Sanchez, 316 to 317, 363 to 365, saying this was a gross violation of their practices. Mr. Isaac, Mr. Isaac this is Judge Ryan. I've got a question, just a timeline. Sure. The, the custodian said that he checked the bathrooms before he started cleaning, right? Yes, he and did. He said there was nobody in the bathroom. The, clearly, then, in the situation is before he started putting stuff down, he got, I guess the video shows he walked away. That's when the plaintiff went into the bathroom. Yeah, he right. said, the, he, 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 if his timeline is correct, he should have seen the plaintiff. The problem is he also said, as you know, Judge Owing, that he had finished cleaning and that there was a a, a yellow uh, wet sign in the area. And you just know that's not true because after the plaintiff fell, you see him squeegeeing two minutes later with foam all over the place. Yeah. 
So, I, I mean, you know, listen, I could say I'm a, I'm a judge on the appellate division. I'm not. Just because he says it doesn't mean it's true. And I have one case to cite. I'm to on the board. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the governor's going to appoint me, but I just want you to take a look at Jean Francois against Port Authority. It's 137 AD 3D 450. I can't really see much of a difference in the case. Affirmative negligence, testimony that shows that there's negligence, expert testimony that isn't controverted in a place of public assembly. The can you give me that site again, please? I can. 137 AD 3D 450, First Department, 2016. And not only does the case mirror this case factually, but it also says in opposition to my adversary's position, partial summary judgment should have also been granted in favor of plaintiff as against British Airways, which contracted for MIC, that's the contractor, to perform monitor installations at its terminal. As an invitee, MIC's negligence is imputed to British Airways. So if the townhouse employee who was alleged to be affirmatively negligent is liable, that's imputed to the owner, and this court should search the record and grant So you're saying that the 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 other defendants, uh, the um, the hotel, uh, yes. the hotel, uh, they don't have to have notice of exactly what um, the the the, uh, the the cleaner, the townhouse employee was doing. They don't need. To, we know they didn't create it, but they don't have to have notice. And, Correct. And, and it, plaintiff doesn't have an obligation to prove that. That's correct. If, if I'm in a place of public assembly and the, the owner or the proprietor of that place of public assembly hires a contractor and that contract is affirmatively negligent, this goes back to Phil Pot against Brooklyn Dodgers, it's, it's so old, then the owner is liable, the entity that is affirmatively negligent is liable, and the way it works for fairness is the owner can get indemnity from the affirmatively negligent party. And that's, that. by the way, I'm sorry, I just went a little cold. That's exactly what Jean Francois says. It's the last paragraph of the opinion. Judge Manzanet, I'm done if you don't have any questions for me. Okay, thank you. And you're thank under you. a minute, so you kept your word. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Kazanski, you, you're always, up. You have four minutes. Thank you, Brian, for being quick. Uh, I, I will try to be quick, but there are a couple of issues. Uh, first of all, we do take issue with the, the plaintiff's representation of the video itself. I just rewatched the video. The video has a timeline that shows when the first, start, first of all, when it first started, the um, Mr. Burgess clearly put out warning signs in and around the area. So the issue for townhouse is whether or not they launched an instrument of harm. He was clearly in the process of doing a routine cleaning um, process. And when you watch the video, it's clear that he's there. He pours it on. They want to say it's dangerous because of the way he did it. But he's still in the process of doing a routine cleaning that every building in New but York City doesn't he does. throw the water on the floor and then kind of step away from it? Your Honor, I, I would say to you Which this. Which to me, I, I is is. I just don't understand that. How do you throw water on the floor and not immediately just stay right there and begin mopping so that no one comes and slips on what you've just thrown on the floor? Okay. First of all, when you watch the video, he's going to the back and he comes back. So this, this, where, you just where, made my point. No, no, no. But he comes right back with, and he squeegees. And then there's a person that walks through the area without, without falling. Then the plaintiff comes and walks through warning signs to go towards the bathroom. Then he begins again to start cleaning up the area. Then two more people walk through the area. So with respect to Counsel, this I, issue- look, I, it doesn't matter that other people were able to traverse the area and not fall. That is irrelevant. Ha, Your Honor, respectfully, that is I don't think it's irrelevant. irrelevant. When you're saying that the routine was improper and that he wasn't doing anything, that he was doing something dangerous, when he's shown already starting to do his cleaning and other people are walking through the area, first of all, that goes towards the owner. The owner, I, as Judge Kapnick brought up, I would say does have an issue of notice in this situation because it's regular cleaning routine that he was doing and while people are able to walk through an area where there are warning signs there where the warning signs are may be a different issue but warning signs are put out and there's plenty of case law that says when warning signs are put out that obviates the duty 
So but, with respect but did the Mr. owner, Bur but Ms. K Kazansky, didn't Mr. Burgos during def deposition admit that he should have, would have been better practice for him to put up some additional um, um, uh, signs near the tables, near the elevator. I looked at those pictures and, and I could see what he was talking about. So I thought he admitted that he should have really put up some extra I, signs to, to sort of protect the whole area. Without having to, con first of all, the procedural posture is both of us lost on our judgment. So I think Judge Kapnick, without really conceding, but having to sort of concede, your question is the question for a jury. There were warning signs out there. The plaintiff walked through the area before the completion of the routine cleaning. Other people walked through the area in terms of after it was poured on. So respectfully, with respect to the owner, if nobody's falling, there's no reason to go over to him and say, your routine is ridiculous or you need to do something else. And also, I would say to you, there has to be a balance between reasonable expectations of the patrons and the reasonable procedures of the cleaning and the hotel. And here, where you have a video that shows a timeline of warning signs put out, wherever they may be, and people able to walk through an area and Mr. Burgess cleaning, whatever, maybe not as clean as it should have been. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Again, I don't want to concede it, but perhaps the lower court was right and summary judgment should have been denied at least to Townsend. I would respectfully say to you that the procedural posture is the plaintiff did not prove that there was any dangerously done condition that the owner should take over for an independent contractor and with people walking through and with warning signs out there, there was no notice of any condition and that we would ask that that be reversed. So I, without any further questions, thank you for your time. I hope everybody's safe and well. Thank you. Same Take to you. care, Brian. Mr. Okay. Isaac? Yes. You have your uh, rebuttal just, time. You yes, have a minute. And, just, and just for the record, it's not Mr. Burgess, it's Mr. Bulgos. Oh, I'm sorry, Justice Manson, Ed. I apologize. <laughs> um, no problem. Go ahead, Mr. Isaac. Yes, uh, Judge Kapnick, it's on 488 and 498 of the record where the defendant admitted, the, the, the cleaner admitted that he needed two more cones and the reason he needed, and I'm quoting, to prevent serious and more danger. Um, my adversary has told you that three people traversed the area. One of them was given a warning. And when you look at the video, two of them actually contorted their body to avoid the water. And this is what the cleaner said. He said that good safety practices, this is 441 to 443, I'm quoting. He would, quote, tell a supervisor to send them, those are patrons, through another corridor so there's no danger when I'm cleaning. And he also said that he would tell, quote, the supervisor to know that the corridor was closed so she could send them to another corridor to avoid danger, 442 to 443. One last point, the fifth floor where this accident happened was the check-in area for the hotel. It wasn't some remote corridor. It was the actual check-in area where everyone had to go. It's a perfect liability case, and you should say so. I have nothing else. Thank Thanks you listening. so much. All right. Uh, kind Operations versus AUA. Uh, Mr. Zimmer, you have five very minutes. Much. Thank you very much, Your Honors. And may it please the court, David Zimmer, on behalf of Appellant Kind. Your Honors, the court below dismissed Kind's complaint uh, only by giving all favorable inferences in to, to defendants rather than to Kind. Uh, Kind's allegations set out a scheme by private equity firm AUA to obtain all of the benefits of True Foods business while jettisoning all unwanted liabilities and contractual obligations. Through the guise of an Article 9 asset sale, True Food be AOG became True Food in every way that matters. Using True Food's name and facilities and goodwill, True Food's employees continued to make the same products for the same customers. Wasn't it, uh, a, wasn't, Council, wasn't it necessary and, and important um, uh, element that there be a continuity of ownership in order to prove a de facto merger? Is, is that what, is that what the law says? Sure. And even, you know, even if even accepting that that's the case, you know, we our allegations establish at the pleading stage de facto merger because we allege that there was continuity at the highest executive levels of management, including the CEO. And as the federal district court recognized in the national gypsum case, that's enough 
uh, at the pleading stage to create an inference, a permissible and indeed a likely inference, that there is continuity of ownership as well. Um, and that inference makes sense for, for at least three reasons. That's just the way that executive compensation works. It's hard to imagine a situation where you had a CEO moving between two companies and not having some sort of ownership of, of both entities. The inference is necessary because without it, it would really gut the de facto merger doctrine. Plaintiffs often don't know uh, exactly what the um, ownership structure of these of these privately held entities are. Um, and, you know, in a rare case where you have continuity at the highest levels of executive management, uh, and, but there's somehow not continuity of ownership, it would be simplicity itself for the defendant to simply, through a 3211A1 motion or, or summary judgment, just introduce the ownership structure. Well, in, in this particular case, wasn't it true that the assets were acquired for cash from third parties? It wasn't like it was a direct like move from one one company into another. There was this situation where they needed some infusion of cash. They they couldn't get it from uh, any um, investors, and so it was acquired for cash from you know from third parties. So there was sort of an interruption there, and that's what sort of counts against this continuity of ownership, which otherwise you know I hear what you're saying. Well, but so so two responses, Your Honor. First of all, I I think that it doesn't. The fact that there was an interruption doesn't matter. This court has held. Uh, in, in multiple cases, NTL capital tap holdings that you can have a de facto merger through an asset sale. And this court made clear uh, in the AMBAC case that you don't look just at one transaction, you look at sort of the start and end points uh, as a whole, and you can have multiple agreements that get you from point A to point B. But more fundamentally, Your Honor, this wasn't really, I mean, it was structured technically as a asset sale through a foreclosure. But if you look at the allegations on uh, a page, uh, paragraphs 36 to 48 of our complaint, this was something that was org orchestrated uh, by AUA from the start. Th these assets never were really held by the lenders. If you look at 141 to 142 of the record, at exactly the same time that the assets went uh, from True Food to uh, the lenders, they then, in a, in a simultaneous agreement on the same day, went from the lenders to AOG. Uh, and, and even before uh, that happened, a, uh, AUA was already creating the AOG entity. It was creating the true food manufacturing holding entities. This was a this was a scheme that was carried out from the start in order to take over the benefits uh, of the of the true food business while jettisoning the liabilities. Uh, and again, it's not. I think it's important to recognize that it's not just the sort of physical assets that were foreclosed upon. That went over. It was the all. It was the employees. It was the name. It was the website. It was the high, highest level executives. It was the managers of the company. AOG at the end of this just was True Food. The only way in which it wasn't is that it disclaimed liabilities. And I think if you look at this court's decision in Highland Crusader from just last year, it, it's exactly the same. Uh, it's exactly the same situation um, where, where just the the, the the subsequent entity, the successor entity became the predecessor entity in every way that actually matters. They're just trying to get rid of the unwanted liabilities. That's exactly what de facto merger is intended to avoid. Um, I want to quickly before I address the intentional interference with contract point two, because I think that if you look at the allegations uh, in paragraphs 47 and 48 of our complaint, I don't think there can be any serious dispute that we actually allege the actual elements of that tort. Um, we allege that there was a valid contract, that AUA knew about it, uh, that AUA directed True Food to breach that contract, uh, and, and that that breach caused damages. And defendant's primary contention is that, well, that we have some sort of, they have some sort of justification for inducing the breach, but it's binding law and controlling law from the Court of Appeals uh, in Foster and White Plains and from this court in Fallon that, that any sort of justification is an affirmative defense that defendants have to raise uh, later. And even if, even if it were relevant at the pleading stage, our allegations make clear uh, that there was no possible uh, justification defense uh, here because AUA didn't have an existing economic interest in true food at the time they induced the breach. And the, the other uh, issue they raise about the ethical behavior in the marketplace, that, that only applies in competitor cases, as the White Plains decision uh, makes clear. And then finally- You, on, you uh, have Mr. time on rebuttal. Okay, okay, thank you very much, Your Honor. Mr. Green, you have five minutes. May it please the court, Daniel Green of Vetter Price for the respondents. Your Honor, this case involves an arm's length transaction in which my client, AOG, acquired for cash the assets of True Food from its secured creditors. And what I'm hearing from appellants counsel is essentially an acknowledgement of that fact. They complain that 
my client sought to acquire the assets of AOG without the liabilities uh, of True Food, rather without the liabilities tagging along, and 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 that's accurate. That that is well, what. So what, this about is his, what about his allegation that um, at the highest level the CEO was the same, and so at this stage, at a thirty to eleven motion, the plaintiff doesn't know exactly what the the mat, the ownership structure of the company is, and shouldn't they have a little opportunity to at least explore that before we throw their case or their claim out. Yes, Your Honor. So my client, AOG, did engage as its CEO, a former principal of True Food, as an employee. And for the first time on this appeal, the appellant has speculated that his compensation package may have included an, an equity component as a performance incentive. The appellant acknowledges their very phrasing is that it's merely a possibility, and this is not an allegation that was reflected anywhere in the complaint. But taking a step back, my client AOG paid nearly $40 million for the assets of True Food, and even were, even were the court inclined to entertain this allegation, and even were the court to inclined to grant it credibility, um, merely providing Mr. Sudas with some component, minority component of equity as a performance incentive would not be sufficient to establish continuity of ownership. And I can assure you that my clients didn't pay $40 million for those assets only to turn around and give a majority of them away to Mr. Sudas. Now, so this is Judge Owing. I have a question. What's your response to the appellant's argument that this whole sale to the secured to the secured uh, party to the secured creditor was a sham. Justice Owing, it's purely conclusory. There the, the appellant has never offered anything that creates an inference that this transaction was anything other than what it purports to be. And we did, pursuant to 3211A1, place the purchase and sale agreement in front of the trial court. The trial court had the opportunity to review it and concluded that there was nothing suspicious about it. And there's no reason for the court to read that into the transaction. This was true food was an entity that was in trouble with its secured creditors. They foreclosed on the assets and then they sold them to my clients for a substantial amount. Anything further? Colleagues, any questions? Anything else, sir? Yes, I just like to direct the court to the fact that there is a damages problem with both the appellant's breach of contract claim and its related tortious interference claim pertaining to the lack of notice. If you look at the actual agreement, uh, you will see that there are two different classes of transaction under which kind would have been entitled to notice a change of control and a cessation of business. Its complaint is predicated on this having been a change of control, which it was entitled to veto, it claims. But in fact, it was very clearly a cessation of business. And all it would have been entitled to do following notice in that situation is negotiate for the purchase of assets used in the manufacture of its product. And in this instance, those assets had been foreclosed upon by the secured creditors who kind acknowledged had interests superior to its own. So this was essentially an illusory right. Even had kind received notice, it would not have been able to negotiate for the purchase of the assets as contemplated by the agreement. Okay, thank you so much. Mr. Zimmer, you have one minute. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, Mr. Zimmer, I, I this is wanted... Judge Owing. I have a yes. question. I'm looking at your amended complaint. Where is it exactly the allegation that the purchase by the defendant here was a sham from the third party secured creditors? Well, the argument, Your Honor, isn't that it's a sham. I think the argument is the same one that this court accepted in Highland, in Highland Crusader. Oh, but which tell is me that... where, ex where exactly in the mid. Well, I mean, the whole, your whole argument relies on that transaction. If it's a legitimate, valid transaction of a sale of an asset, you, how do you attack that? Because that's what the defendant is arguing. You're saying that, no, something else happened. 
And I'm looking at your amended complaint, and I don't see that allegation as something else was involved in this transaction. Well, I mean, I think that what else, the other thing that happened. Well, the, that we the question is: is the is the allegation there in your amended complaint? Well, sure. I think if you look at thirty-eight to forty-six, it lays out paragraphs looking thirty-eight to forty. I'm looking at it. I don't see anything about how the transaction to the secure creditors was something that should be suspect. Well, I don't think I don't think that the de facto merger doctrine requires something sort of suspect. The point is just that what they acquired was more than just the assets. They acquired all of the intangibles, all of the benefits of True Foods business. It doesn't. We're not. It doesn't. It's not. We're not. Council, uh, council. My response to that is that if you look at the asset sale agreement, the document itself in which the defendant was able to get the access of True Food, it doesn't back you up. That document, as I read it clearly, says we're only buying the assets. We're not buying the liabilities. Sure, and that's exactly what the de facto merger doctrine uh, steps in to sort of say. Well, you can't do that if what you're doing is acquiring the business as a whole. And again, that's what this court held in Highland. In Highland Crusaders specifically, I, yeah, and I, but I think in Highland Crusaders you didn't have the insertion of a third of secured creditors, did you? No, but in NTL Capital and Tap Holding, this court repeatedly. No, so no. the answer is no, no. right? No. no, the answer okay. to that question is no. But this court has held in other cases that that doesn't that that doesn't matter. And AMBAC too, that you just look at the beginning and you look at you look at the end. I <coughs> I, I also just I know I'm also going, there's, the sure old, I'm just, there's the old saying called the intervening acts. <laughs> That can happen too. But this court again in AMBAC and NTL Capital and Tap Holdings, there were the same thing there, and the court fell held that there was a de facto merger, or at least there were allegations that. You're not answering my, my question. Is very simple. All those cases you rely on, unless I misread them, they don't have an insertion of an intervening party. They absolutely do, um, Your Honors. Um, in in both NTL Capital and in Tap Holdings, there was a foreclosure just like here. It was exactly the same. And in AMBAC, the court made clear that you don't just look at one contract, one deal. You look at where things started and where things ended. Uh, and that's all we're asking the court to do to do here. Um, okay, just thank you. You're out of time, you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. We have your brief. Thank you. Figur versus Ray Enterprises. Mr. Lino, you have five minutes. Oh. You're muted, counsel. I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Your Honor, and All good right. afternoon. Good uh, afternoon. You can hear me now, right? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the central issue for the case, for the appeal, is whether or not defendants' claims and cross-claims in an interpleader action can be diverse and independent and adverse. And the statute in the case law makes very clear that they can be independent. They can be adverse. They can be diverse. They don't have to be dependent upon the subject matter the stakeholders claim. Uh, CPLR 1006 says cross claims can be adverse and independent. You can't object if the claims don't have a common origin or if the stakeholder states that he has no liability. We've cited a line of cases which support that, too. In the Nelson case, court said that inconsistent claims do not bar interpleader. In Chowdhury, the court said best practice is to deposit the funds into court and then let the parties litigate their rights to the funds. In Leventhal, court held that interpleader re means requiring adverse claimants to litigate their claims in the action with or without the stakeholder and, uh, and so on. I, I would just cite you to the court. Main thing is the interpleader statute specifically abolished the earlier limitations, which required that cross claims be related and dependent upon that stakeholder action. Furthermore, our, that is the appellant's argument is shored up even further by the pleading rules and CPLR 3019B Quote, a cross claim may be any cause of action. Siegel New York practice says a cross claim may be, quote, any claim at all. And the one case we cited there, AO Asset Management, quote, a cross claim is defined as any cause of action. The error of the trial court was they went old school. They went with the worldview before that amendment to the interpleader uh, uh, rule. And the rule was amended back in about 1954. After that, 
you could plead anything in those cross claims and claims. The trial court judge required that those claims of my client and Ferguson be related to the stakeholder. And that was the error of law. That was the abuse of discretion by the court below. Let me just um, move on to the uh, next point then too. Uh, on the subpoenas, conventional discovery was not viable. Defendant Schneider admitted that the records were not available. He either lost them or destroyed them regardless, but my client Ferguson had no choice but to do a subpoena and serve a subpoena. Secondly, the records sought were definitely relevant. The bank records were necessary for uh, the breach of fiduciary duty claim, uh, and it would have gone to Defendant Schneider's self-dealing when he cut a check for $50,000 to himself without authority, that kind of wrongful self-dealing. Bank records would have shown that. Also, the procedure surrounding the arbitration and the mortgage uh, foreclosure that was caused by that would have been revealed in the records from the liquidating uh, trustee and from the attorney that was subpoenaed. Um, and once again, for both appeals, all of those uh, matters relate to my client's cross claims and claims and ability to defend on Schneider's claims. Um, so they were definitely all material and relevant. If the okay. court- Mr. Lino, here, you have time on yeah. rebuttal and okay, we'll hear you, you then, okay? All right, uh, Ms. Fantino, are you with us now? Yes, I am, Your Honor, can you hear me? Yes, I can, you may proceed, you have five minutes. May it please the court, Lisa Fantino, Lines McGovern for respondents. This case looks complex because appellant has continued to return to something that was settled in the fourth department eight years ago. The sole issue in this interpleader action is to settle the proceeds between the party. And the parties agree totally that those proceeds derive from the sale of two properties, one on Chestnut Street and one on Euclid Street. Those positions have been made on the record numerous times by both parties on papers and an oral argument before the Honorable Tanya Kennedy. The parties also agree numerous times on the record that not one cent of the escrow funds has ever belonged to the now defunct corporation called Maximus Hill or Max Hill. Counsel, PPL this is Judge Oink. Counsel, this is Judge yeah. Oink. Is that Maximus Hill, that went to arbitration, but that arbitration never concluded, correct? Uh, not quite, Your Honor. That went to arbitration because the parties who could not get along decided to dissolve the corporation. In doing so, the arbitrator's panel engaged a liquidating trustee. That liquidating trustee put it up for auction, and respondents held the winning bid. However, despite the panel's order and an executed stipulation between the parties, appellant refused to sign the deed to transfer the property. So while um, the, the parties did execute the stipulation, uh, no money was spent further on that arbitration. It was then also challenged in the fourth department. And th this matter was decided eight years ago because when appellant had a right to appeal a decision in that matter, he did not uh, prosecute it timely. And the court refused to listen to him on his second go round. Uh, on the issue of the cross claim, uh, what say you with respect to counsel's argument that uh, it does not have to uh, relate to the original complaint? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, CPLR 3019B clearly states that the cross claim may include, not must, may include a claim that the party against whom it is asserted is or may be liable to the cross claimant appellant herein for all or part of a claim asserted in the action against the cross claimant. Here, the instant interpleader. The only claim before them in the instant interpleader is how to divide the monies that don't belong to Max Hill and never have. There's no dispute over that fact. Okay. Six but how does that address the vibe? Why? 
notwithstanding what you've just said, even if I accept everything you've just said, why can they not bring a uh, uh, the cross claim on the 3019B? It doesn't have to be connected to the original action. Not to the original action, but against the liability that's exposed against the party he's asserting the cross claim against. In other words, if there's a... The, sec the, the CPLR is very clear. It says whether or not it's related to the plaintiff's main claim. Well, yes, as okay. long as there is a as long as there is a right and a connection to that underlying claim. Where does it say that in the statute? May it doesn't say that in the, the statute. You're adding to the statute language that doesn't exist. And counsel, uh, to, to, to add to that point, uh, assuming the cross claim, uh, is, uh, assuming the opponent's correct and he can assert the cross claim, and you're arguing that that cross claim is related to a matter that's already been resolved, the litigation been resolved and determined. Your 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 choice would then to be to move to dismiss the cross claims as race judicata, correct? I mean, it's not like you're out of luck. Well, we, we m made a motion for summary judgment, and the seven, six of the seven cross claims. I understand claims that, right, right? We understand that, but if 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 Justice Manzanet is correct that the cross claim should have been permitted, and assuming that is that is the case, you can still move to dismiss the cross claims based on race judicata if, in fact, your arguments or your recitation of the procedural history is accurate. Well, we will have to address that down the road if that's the eventuality. Okay. All right. Anything else? Uh, no, unless the court has further questions. Oh, yes. Can, can I just say that, you know, we were confident in the arguments we still are that we outlined in our brief. But we felt compelled to appear here today because in 25 years of practice, I have never been accused of falsifying issues to any tribunal, including this honorable court. And I state that because it's never happened. I also wanted to address the shocking allegation raised by appellate in his brief that the trial judge swept cross claims under the rug. That also never happened. Both motions were presented artfully in oral argument, at which time the court asked insightful questions of both parties. That happened before rendering a decision. So uh, that is one of the reasons that we wanted to appear here today. Thank you. You have Thank a good you, day. Honor. All right, Ms. Mr. Lino, you have one minute. Quickly, the reason the arbitration ended was due to non-payment of fees to AAA. It didn't have to do with uh, liquidating the company. We stated that in our brief and we cited the record to back ourselves up. Secondly, with regard to the Maximus Hill litigation of eight years ago, that was not decided. Uh, that case was a, a merely a mortgage foreclosure case with limited scope. Uh, respondent argues race judicata. Race judicata only applies to claims that were brought or could have been brought. We, in our appendix, included the operating agreement for the limited liability company, Maximus Hill. There's an ADR clause. Sole jurisdiction is with the arbitration forum. Schneider started that arbitration, which messed things up for the company and threw it into foreclosure. And then when it came time for my client to air out his claims, Schneider didn't pay the fees and damages were caused. Finally, okay. uh, on that 3019B, the opposing counsel did not give the whole quote. The whole quote is that the claim can be anything, more or less. And unfortunately, the lower court went with the old paradigm before the paradigm shift with a very narrow view of interpleader for 50 years. It's been more expansive. My client has a right to plead and prove his claim now that that has happened. Thank, Thank you, you so much. People versus, oh, I'm sorry, Kutri versus Wolf. Mr. Cochran, you have four minutes. May it please the court. Good afternoon, Kieran good afternoon. Corcoran from Good afternoon from Simpson LLP for uh, petitioner appellant Saro Putri. Uh, time is short, so I'll get right to it. In this case, an arbitration panel issued a final award, which was confirmed by the Supreme Court without opposition by the respondents. In the judgment and order that award, now the judgment, expressed an unequivocal mandate. 
to the respondent directors, who are the uh, uh, appellees here. We know this because the panel in the arbitration said so, declaring its orders to be, quote, binding on these respondents. Well, let me let me ask you, be, um, because I know that's your argument, and I was taking a look uh, the other day at parts of the arbitrator's award, and there was a section called future, um, and it, it, it talked about the directors will make every effort to be fair to the clients. They have to take into account certain things. I mean, it wasn't like a, an arbitral award, like you get $100,000 or you must do this. It sort of was, um, you know, hope. hopefully things will work out in the future and people will work together. And that, I think the court, um, the trial court found that very difficult to uh, say, well, um, you know, you're in contempt for not complying with that because they were hopeful um, more than, you know, um, uh, demands or, or, you know, orders is what I mean. Well, I, 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 I beg to differ respectfully because the arbitration panel found that these directives, they're not hopes, they were directives and they're enumerated one through uh, three at uh, the record 55 to 56. Yeah, that's what I have, right? Yeah, and in 56, it, they go further to say these directors are binding on the respondent directors. But I don't know what more the panel could have said to make it clear and unequivocal these had to be followed. And number one says the claimants, which includes uh, appellant here, Mr. Kutri, will participate in all future funds. That's not a hope. That's you will do this. And this will be binding on you. But but you know I I mean I, to be to be fair the page before that um, on page fifty five of the record before it gets to number one specifically says the panel understands that the directors made the following representations to it in the course of this opera uh, of this arbitration that they would do these things so these were what they're saying is these are representations that the directors made. Um, in the course of the arbitration. So I, I, I think you have to add that in and it's not as clear cut as what you're saying. Well, okay, I understand your point, but at, at, at 56 of the record, it says after these enumerated points, as a result, those commitments are binding on the respondent directors with regard to future funds. But what could binding mean other than they have to do these things? The, the point is, there, there has to be a reasonable balance. And the last part of number three says, uh, Mr. Kutri's participation in LV3 is fair and reasonable. So everything needs to be balanced according to that. Now, what we have here in this case is that they cut him out completely. And they told him and everyone else they were going to cut him out completely. And then they did. And then they launched a billion dollars of two new funds and have cut him out completely. So, um, I, what what can a panel say, an arbitration panel say, more clearly than these enumerated points are binding upon respondents? I, 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 I'm a, <laughs> seldom at a loss for words, but if, if, if that is not binding, what is binding? So he will participate, okay? This particip participation will be significant and not de minimis. Now, here, here's a real good point. We know that the directors understood this mandate because they obeyed it for a few years. They obeyed it in LV4 and LV5, and they gave Mr. Kutri participation. And so, well, they, 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 there is, I, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but also on page 55, before the sentence I read before, it says the panel, that's the arbitral panel, understands that circumstances surrounding future funds can differ and that it is not realistic for the directors to make an exact black and white commitment as to the level of claimant's participation in future funds. So, you know, right. they... It's they not so clear. To but they me. have to be able to participate, whether they get 24 basis points out of, you know, 1500 or 28 out of, of 2000. That's that's one can differ over that. And in fact, in LV4 and LV5, where they allow you to participate, they Judge change. Wang, this is, I think now, Judge Wang has a question. I have a quick question. Whatever the arbitrators say in their decision, that decision has to also be read in conjunction with any of the governing governing financial documents, correct? I mean, the arbitrators cannot overrule 
a governing document, right? I mean, they well, can't. What, well, they're, they interpret, what they were doing here is they were interpreting the governing documents that existed. Right. They, the yeah, yeah, understood. But they can't disregard a specific, ter specific terms of a go governing document. They don't have that power to do that, right? Well, well, the arbitrators have the power to make to to, to uh, consider the issues before them and make a decision, right? I understand that. I get, I mean, you're not answering the, the question. Okay. Is very simple. An arbitrator does not have the authority to set aside any language in a governing document. They can <coughs> they can interpret it. They can look at it. But if it's clear, they can't set it aside. I don't believe they did that here. Okay. So here. so here's the point. Here's the point with respect to the transaction that's at issue here. The, the, the principles put out there are saying that we want to do this. We want to, we want to do this transaction and put it out to the, to the Class B members, right? And they all voted for it, except for your client, right? Well, no? That, did they not well, not all of them, no, not all of them. A majority, the majority, a majority of them did. To your honor, there's, there's no legal precedent that I'm aware of that a majority of a private company can overrule a judicial right embodied in a judgment and order of a court and say that we are going to overrule that. The which judgment is doesn't, uh, the judgment in this court doesn't exactly back you up on that. I mean, I'm not so sure the judgment actually say that, but I'll take a look at that. The, the judgment does not say that you can, you can just eliminate this, this directive by entering in any kind of corporate merger or reverse merger, whatever you want to, to de facto take away these rights. And I don't see how other people who are, who are not part of this arbitration can vote around the rights that my client gained in the arbitration and strip him of them. Specifically when these other people's, you know, several which are insiders at the company and they're making a mockery of the arbitration and the award that was issued below, in my opinion. All right, you'll have time on rebuttal. Mr. Bowman, you have four minutes. Good afternoon, may it please the court, Philip Bowman for the respondents. I want to start by addressing uh, the petitioner's argument about uh, he asked rhetorically, what could binding possibly mean? And his argument is actually quite misleading in, in what he quoted the court, because the, the very next sentence explains exactly what binding means in this context. The next sentence is a citation to the Chemical Bank versus Aetna case. And it said, and the quote there is, the doctrine of judicial estoppel relied on by defendant provides that where a party assumes a certain position in a legal proceeding and succeeds in maintaining that position, he may not thereafter, simply because his interests have changed, take a contrary position. And um, that's a, a record. It's a, a, yeah, but a what, 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 how is how is that applicable here? How did anybody yeah. take a contrary I, position? I don't I don't think it is. I think that the question of how judicial estoppel applies is a question for another day and not for this court. There's no there's no application here. The question for this court is whether there was a clear and unequivocal mandate. And I'm just explaining binding. When the court said binding, it clearly wasn't talking about this is a binding order. It was saying our view, the panel's view, is that this particular these statements by the directors, by the respondents, would be subject to judicial stop. That's all. And if there's any doubt about it, um, you can turn. Well, you, you you are not suggesting, are you, that 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 language was just. Uh, superfluous language that has no meaning in in the arbitrator's final decision do you i i don't think it has any legal significance in terms of what the award was and and the reason i say that is, is because the, the the on a few pages later um it's the record at 59 to 60 the the panel issues its actual award and it says it in clear terms it says the undersigned arbitrators hereby enter, enter the following final arbitration award. So the, and, the, the pages that we were talking about earlier that counsel and I were talking about 55, 56, 57 were kind of weren't in the award section. They were in a future something section, right? <laughs> That's correct. They're, 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 I, I think your honor is correct. There's a little bit of there's sort of some ambiguity about what exactly the arbitrators are doing there. There's a lot of expression of hope and intent. And then the arbitrators go on to say, well, and here's I, but didn't hope. that hope and intent come from uh, the fact that that uh, uh, your adversary was concerned about this very eventuality that there would be additional funds that they that he would be squeezed out of. And so those those 
issues were clearly in front of the arbitrator. Can we agree on that? Well, I, I think we can agree on that, but I don't think that really goes to the question of whether there whether there is contempt of court. Well, and in other words, I, you, you're jumping argument. ahead of me. I'm, I'm I'm trying to go through this analysis. So if right. if that language was was meaningful and it was a discussion and an issue that the arbitrators were considering, uh, and uh, it seems to me that the arbitrators properly. Uh, understood that that they could not uh, anticipate what the conditions would be for a future fund and therefore could not uh, provide exacting language of how a future fund would operate. But clearly from the language in the in the uh, arbitrator's decision, they envisioned that uh, that uh, that the 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 uh, uh, party here would be able to participate in future funds in some way. Your Honor, they they might have envisioned that, but I think what we have to concern ourselves with is what did they what did they order, and what did they have the legal authority to order? And I think Justice Boyne pointed this out: the the arbitration panel couldn't order these respondents to provide future carry because they determined in this very case that there was no legal basis to do that. Could and could so, the arbitrate, was the issue of whether uh, there would be a buyout even presented during the arbitration? It absolutely was not. Okay. So that the, that, that the, the, the conduct that, that, that he's claiming that the petitioner is claiming constitutes a breach of a mandate was not even contemplated in the order. There's nothing about this transaction in the order. Okay. And, and in that case, counsel, and in that case, because it's silent, there's, we didn't talk about the about a buyout. It's governed by whatever happened, the transaction is governed by the governing documents, right? I mean, in terms of how that process goes through, which is why the class B members it was presented to class B members, a majority of them voted for this transaction, and that's the way it ended up. I think that's exactly right, Justice Lloyd. Okay. Thank you so much. Mr. Thank Cochran, you. you have one minute. Thank you. I, I'd like to um, address um, the Honorable Justice Lloyd's last point. The fact that the buyout was not mentioned is, is really exactly the point here, um, and the, the court recognized that as well. The, the arbitration panel couldn't sit there and anticipate every single way that Lux might envision to try to take an end run around this order. But what it said very clearly is that Mr. Kutri will participate in the future funds in a significant manner relative to his participation in one of the prior funds. Anything that violates that, whether or not it was discussed in the arbitration, is a problem and is a violation. Okay, they didn't have to spend, you know, a counsel, year. But counsel, this is Judge Joint. But to borrow that, but to take your argument to the next step, that would essentially handcuff the the managing members from operating this organization or this entity, because then your client would then be. It's like the tail wagging the dog, then, because your client's going to be able to do the veto. He's going to be the super super op. Uh, managing member in that sense because whatever the members or managing members trying to do your clients going to be able to veto that and i'm not so your arbitrators are gave that power to your client well Just first of all from your argument well well first of all mr mr Cucci was one of the original investors in this company and the company might not exist but for people I like I understand him. that, but I'm just yeah. taking logically your argument means then that your client's going to be now imbued with this authority that well, I don't think the operating documents or the government documents ever gave him. Well, they cut him out and said, you'll get nothing. He tried to resolve it and he accepted what they gave him in LV4 and LV5, and he right. probably would have accepted whatever they gave him in LV6. Instead, exactly. they decided to give him the death penalty instead, which is what they can't well. do. He didn't. He got a payout, though. He, it's not like he didn't get a payout with that, right? They offered him a unilateral price base, not including any, the billion dollars of funds they had on their doorstep. And I then understand decided, that. Take, take what we offer and nothing more. I'm hearing you. I'm just my concern is with your argument 
you've created a situation where your client becomes the super managing member. Well, an arbitration panel. All right, we're not going to debate that point. Okay. We're over time. Thank you, Thank gentlemen. You. Thank Next you. case, People v. Brandon Simmons. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Jody Ratner on behalf of appellant Brandon Simmons. We ask this court to invalidate Mr. Simmons' adjudication as a second felony offender on the basis of precedent set by this court in two recent cases. Well, Ms. Ms. Ratner, can I ask you a question first? Good afternoon. Um, I was on the prior appeal in this case um, in 2019, and we specifically said that we adhered to our previous determination, which we said was expressed not as dicta, but as what was intended to be an alternative holding that the Pennsylvania statute issue is the equivalent of a New York felony. So how could Mr. Simmons then go back to the trial judge for the resentencing, which we ordered and make new arguments to prove that the Pennsylvania statute at issue was not an equivalent after we already said it was the equivalent? So, um, Your Honor, I believe that that ruling of this court um, is no longer applicable. It's not law of the case because this court not only did it vacate the sentence, but it remanded for an opportunity for Mr. Simmons to got controvert the allegations in the predicate felony statement. And that is what we did. We went back to the trial court. We raised two new different arguments. Uh, importantly, neither those arguments could not have been raised at the first predicate adjudication because the cases had not been decided at that time. So these were two new arguments that were raised. Uh, there was briefing based on, on the case, like based on the Muhammad case. Is that it? The People versus Muhammad? Yes, Your Honor, Muhammad and also People versus Ramos. Um, so those arguments were new. Uh, the trial court uh, made a written decision on the two new arguments and now we are appealing from that decision um, and this court now has the opportunity to rule on this preserved argument now. Um, in addition, that decision was uh, the prior decision, the trial court decision resulted in the imposition of an illegal sentence and an illegal sentence cannot be considered law of the case. And so uh, we are now at the time where this court uh, can apply these. Um, it's, excuse me, Judge Mazzaro, it's only an illegal sentence if the person, if the defendant is deemed not to be a predicate, correct? Correct. And, and so we believe if he's that deemed, these, if he's believe deemed that to be a predicate, cases, then it's legal, right? Correct. Uh, but we believe that the two cases decided by this court, um, including by Your Honor, uh, Judge Kapnick, as well as Justice Owing, those decisions that, um, as well as Ramos, Muhammad and Ramos, um, they compel this court to find that the Pennsylvania um, statute cannot be, lose, cannot be used as a predicate. It is exactly like the Florida statute. Um, the wording is incredibly similar. The case law on which both of those um, statutes rely is incredibly similar. And as this court held, in Muhammad and in Ramos, the fact that um, in that those cases, the fact that the Florida statute require, had a knowledge element requiring knowledge merely of the illicit nature of the controlled substance, but not what the substance itself actually was, means that it is broader than New York felonies, which require knowledge of the exact controlled substance. Doesn't that give the people the opportunity to present the accusatory instrument and the facts in the accusatory instrument, which in this case, if I'm reading the record correctly, include uh, specificity with respect to the type of substance, crack, cocaine, well, powder, cocaine? It, it doesn't require that, but the, the accusatory instrument- No, I didn't instrument say require it, I said allow it. It does not even allow it. The only time it is necessary to look at the accusatory instrument is if there is a question um, about which subsection the defendant was convicted of in the other state. Here, the people's predicate statement clearly say that they were, that uh, Mr. Simmons was convicted of the first clause. And so we do not even need to go there. But even if we do go there, even if we see the fact that cocaine is in the accusatory instrument, 
it's a red herring. It doesn't matter what he was convicted of. What matters is are the elements equivalent in the Pennsylvania statute and the New York statute? And they are not equivalent because the, there is a broader knowledge uh, element in Pennsylvania than New York. So for example, in Pennsylvania, even if it is, let's say it's cocaine, somebody can be convicted of possessing a brown sack of something that they know is illegal. They don't know that it's cocaine and they're ultimately they are charged with cocaine. They know it's something illegal. They sell it to somebody else. That is sufficient for a conviction in Pennsylvania. That is not sufficient for a conviction in New York. In New York, as the uh, cases of Muhammad and Ramos state, the defendant needs to know the item, the controlled substance that they are charged with is that controlled substance. Okay. You'll have uh, a minute on rebuttal. Mr. Goldfein, we'll hear from you now. Good afternoon, your honors, and may it please the court, Samuel Goldfein on behalf of the people. Um, I'd like to start where um, your honor Justice Kapnick did with the fact that this issue has been litigated and resolved specifically in this case. In 2019, this court ruled that defendant was properly adjudicated a second felony offender on the basis of this Pennsylvania conviction. As far as I'm aware that this court has had an opportunity to engage with this Pennsylvania statute, they've reached the same conclusion that it's overbroad, that you should you can examine the accusatory instrument and that there are certain discrete acts in which this statute could be violated that would amount to a felony in New York. Cases that my adversary is discussing about a Florida statute are an opposite. They're a Florida statute, it's a different statute, it's not the one at issue here. But it's very similar. So the well, your point Honor, that she makes is a valid point. Well, Your Honor, I would just note that in, in the Ramos decision, this court noted that the Florida legislature had, en had enacted a clarifying statute to say that drug crimes in Florida knowledge is not an element of drug offenses. So I think that there's a much broader distinction between the, the Florida statute at issue and this Pennsylvania statute at issue here. And when Are you, you suggesting that it is, that it is, <laughs> there's no question that the Pennsylvania statute and the New York statute are different. Absolutely. There's no right. question about that. No question. And that the Pennsylvania statute is broader. Absolutely. Can we at right. least agree on that? Abs no, absolutely, Your Honor. I'm with you 100%. Okay. It's, it's broader. So and please tell me how you get around Muhammad. Right. So well, I get around Muhammad by simply saying that Muhammad is, is a different case about a different statute. When this court has examined this Pennsylvania statute. Counsel, but it, 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 <laughs> It's it is right on point in terms of the issues being raised, right? Uh, respect the broadness of the statute. You don't have to know exactly what kind of illegal drug you have, and that's enough to be convicted. Same as in Pennsylvania. I disagree that it's the same as in Pennsylvania, Your Honor. In the Florida statute, there was no requirement of guilty knowledge. Guilty knowledge is not an element of drug offenses, period. That's what this court said that the Florida legislature had clarified. This Pennsylvania statute has a knowledge requirement. It might, it's it's slightly different. It's not worded the same as the knowledge requirement in New York. It's broader. You don't have to know exactly what kind of drug you have. I, I, I like agree I with said. your honor. I, I agree with your honor, but when you examine, but because there's various ways you could violate the statute, various discrete acts, both you know counterfeit substances or controlled substances, different types of substances, um, some of those would be felonies in New York and some of them would not. So when we look at the accusatory instrument here, defendant was charged with, he pled guilty to, knowingly and intentionally possessing a controlled substance to wit cocaine. That's what the accusatory instrument says. That conduct would unquestionably be a felony in New York. Um, so I, I accept that there is a distinction with this Florida statute, but that's quite frankly not the situation here. We're trying to, to you know, shove a square peg into a round hole when we have six round pegs, Diaz, uh, Molero, Ivy, Simmons, Thompson. How about Ramos? Ramos was about a Florida statute, Your Honor. I, I, so the same, the same analysis. Respectfully, Your Honor, I, I disagree. Um, and, and you know, I think there are different statutes, and the analysis is different. The Florida statute had no guilty requirement at all. This Pennsylvania statute does. And here, a defendant was charged with knowingly and intentionally possessing cocaine, which would be a felony in New York. And I, just if I could briefly turn to the um, the collateral estoppel, the race judicata. Um, the, the argument that there's no final judgment here, I think, is completely belied by the Sentel Smith case from last year. There, um, the case was, was reversed on a, on Arama grounds in 2015, uh, and it was also found that he uh, not have, that they uh, they rule against him on the predicate issue. And when the case came back, they ruled collateral estoppel prevented him from re-arguing 
the predicate issue. So this court has already decided the predicate issue in this case. You did it explicitly. Was on the panel um, in 2019. And I think for those reasons, defendant's conviction should be affirmed. He committed a felony in Pennsylvania. That would be a felony in New York. Thank you. Ms. Ratner, you have a minute. Yes, two brief things. Um, as to the Ramos case and the um, guilty knowledge, that was a totally separate issue in that case, in that decision. Um, that was not pertaining to the issue that's before this court, um, which is, um, as Justice Manzanet explained, that it is the uh, pr precisely, practically the same language that we are looking at. Um, the only other thing I would add is that the 2019 decision in this case, as well as the prior decisions of this court um, in which this uh, statute has been addressed, um, this issue that we are now raising was not preserved in any of those cases. And so those cases, while they might have um, been ruled on uh, correctly at that time, in this case, there is a different issue presented to this, to this court, and uh, which we suggest that Muhammad and Wayne must compel um, the conclusion that the Pennsylvania predicate is invalid. Thank you, Thank Your you Honor. Thank you so much. People v. Dijon Melendez. Ms. Ahn. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. From, good afternoon. Lois Ahn from Wild Gotchel appearing on behalf of Mr. Dejan Melendez along with the Office of Appellate Defender. This, this court should reverse Mr. Melendez's conviction on assault two based on the trial court's failure to instruct the jury to stop deliberating in accordance with Velez. This court has found reversible error in- what wasn't, I agree with you that, that the court did not uh, utilize the recommended CJI language uh, much to our chagrin, but, but didn't the language that the court used uh, communicate the same thing and have the same effect? So either de stop deliberations or uh, uh, you you have to if you find not guilty for this reason you find not guilty on two and three that it essentially is saying stop deliberations on two and three. So I disagree, Your Honor. Um, with respect to the to respondents' argument that the principle conveyed is the same, that goes directly against what Velez is all about. The entire purpose of Velez is that words matter and that the language used by the trial court- The entire to, purpose of Velez is to make sure that someone who has been acquitted by a jury of a top count on the basis of justification doesn't get convicted of a lower count. That's the reason for Velez. So going back to the instruction that was given here, as your, your honor mentioned, um, the instruction, the trial court failed to provide a stop deliberations charge. In fact, the instruction given here was virtually identical to the ones this court already found deficient in Velez and in Wa. And well, not with Hang on a second, counsel. Uh, did you look at People versus Macon? Were we, yeah. were we said 186 AD 3rd 430, where the court did mention stop deliberation, but used the same language that's at issue here when it says, you must record a not guilty verdict on count three if you find the defendant not guilty under count two for some other reason than lack of justification, then proceed to consider and render a verdict on count three. Sort of what was said here, right? I mean, the court was saying, saying if you find if you find him not guilty for any other reason, go on to the next two counts. So, so that's, Your Honor, what, that's something what we said was okay in that case. Uh, Your Honor, uh, that case, the instruction is distinguishable because the trial court there instructed the jury to, quote, then don't deliberate on count three, which is not the instruction that was given here. And regards to the language, uh, Justice Owing, that you were referring to, um, yes, that instruction was given, but in addition to the deficient stop deliberations charge that was given by the trial court, there were other numerous misleading instructions that oh, suggested- counsel, but this, but this, but this charge was even more specific. It says, you then must find defendant not guilty of counts one, two, and three. Okay, that's, 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 that's pretty clear as to what they're telling, what the judge or the court's telling them, because if you find someone not guilty of one, two, and three, which is only the three counts that we're dealing with here, what else is there the jury supposed to sue? I mean, that's it. That's stop deliberation right there at that point. And I honestly that's don't understand why the defense would ever think that that's a bad instruction. So and, you're, 
And, and, and just to add to that, it seems that the judge made that instruction um, following a, a note or request from the jury. And after the judge made that particular charge, the defendant did not object to it and the jury began deliberating. Uh, so uh, going back to the point on that instruction that told that told the jury to only deliberate on the lower counts if finding uh, defendant not just finding defendant not guilty on some other grounds. Yes, that instruction was there, but that one sentence is not enough to undo the deficient instruction and the numerous other misleading instructions that suggested that the jury keep deliberating. For example, if I may, did, uh, as far as I read the record, this argument was not preserved. Your, yes, Your Honor, it's true. It wasn't preserved, but this court has reversed 14 cases following Velez in the interest of justice, and this court should do so well, here as well. this case is a little different. First of all, it's a puzzle to me why the justification charge was given to begin with. But in this case, there's overwhelming evidence that there was no justification and overwhelming evidence of the defendant's guilt. This is not uh, a fight between two people that there could be a justification charge. This, this, this case is very, very different. Uh, Your Honor, if I may briefly uh, first address the point on the other misleading instructions. Uh, there was the instruction that while instructing the jury on the verdict sheet that the jury consider the three top offenses as options or choices and that they consider them in the alternative. So those that's an example of a misleading instruction that could have well, that, that, that you know, counsel, that's accurate because the, the initial charge that the court gave, I mean, I, I couldn't understand it either. It was really confusing so that that's why at the end when the court gave its final charge, after the jury problem, I mean, I couldn't understand it, so the jury's not going to understand it. It finally clarified it's very succinctly what it, what the jury had to, to deliberate on. And as Justice Masarelli said, there was, and we all said there was no objection to that from defense counsel. And in spite of all those 14 cases where we did the interest of justice, we did come down with one case that finally said, look, this has been around for a long time, this issue now. You need to preserve this issue. You can't just accept and come to the court and say it's an interest of justice. Not after, not after we've done it 14 times. I mean, we've now, now it's out there. I forget the side of the case, but we had explicitly said, you gotta know, you gotta preserve this now. <laughs> So, Your Honor, I disagree that the trial court the second time around succinctly uh, instructed the jury on justification because when... That may be the case, but defense counsel didn't say boo. That's true, Your Honor, but regardless, preservation or not, the harm done to Mr. Melendez is the same. And the deficient charge, along with other misleading charges, rendered the verdict unreliable. And that's the same grounds on which this court decided it in the interest of justice in Wa, in Velez, in Breckenridge, and in Herrera. And so your argument, counsel, would be that going forward, even, even, no matter what, it's always going to be in the interest of justice analysis, no matter what, regardless of preservation. Now. That's, what you're, that's what you're arguing. Not necessarily, Your Honor. Um, this oh, court doesn't... Okay. <laughs> this court does not it's have wonderful. to... Yeah. step that far in, deci in deciding to review this issue because the facts of this case are such that there is a real real reasonable possibility that harm was done. The, the trial court had to strike its justice even charge the first time around in its entirety. And um, briefly going addressing uh, Justice Mazzarelli's point on overwhelming evidence, there was an overwhelming evidence just disproving justification. The defendant told the detective during the interview that he felt threatened by the two brothers, one of whom, by the way, had already beaten him up, and that Mr. Shreddy had a razor. And the complainant's own trial testimony supported key facts of Mr. Melendez's account of what happened. Mr. Cook. All right, you can tell us about that on rebuttal. I've let you go way over time, okay? Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Lewis, you have five minutes. May it please the court, I'll be very brief. Um, I just want to make one point going to Justice Mazzarelli's um, justification does not even apply to a victim who pose no threat of deadly physical force. And I have a cite um, to a case for that. It's People v. Freeman, 159 AD 3D 1334 from the Fourth Department, 2018. Leave was denied. And importantly, the trial court didn't even instruct the jury on transferred intent. Um, and I'm just going to ask for an affirmance if the court has no questions for me. 
Okay, any questions? No? Okay, Miss uh, Ahn, you have one minute. Um, going back to uh, the justification point, uh, respondent argues that Mr. Cook presented no danger to Mr. Melendez, but that's not true. Mr. Cook testified during trial that he admitted to trying to incite violence. He said during trial that uh, he told Mr. Melendez to put the knife. Counsel, the jury heard all of this, though, and, and they made their credibility determinations. Not necessarily, that issue. not necessarily, Your Honor, because the jury wasn't properly instructed on the stop, on the stop deliberation charge. And um, there was sufficient evidence presented at trial showing justification, including the fact that the complainant was an unreliable witness uh, who was who had prior convictions for crimes involving dishonesty and gave trial testimony that was vague, evasive. He was combative against defense counsel during some parts of trial, and he gave a testimony that was inconsistent in parts with the testimony that he gave to the grand jury. So for these reasons, Your Honors, uh, we ask that you reverse Mr. Melinda's conviction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. An. I understand you two are pro bono counsel on this case? Yes, Your Honor. I want to thank you and your firm for giving pro bono service uh, to the court. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Your Honors, for your time. All right. Um, Alloy Advisory, Mr. Montclair, you have five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Um, Paul Montclair for the appellant, 503 West 33rd Street, etc. Um, I want to focus on a very straightforward issue in this case, which I think is dispositive. And that issue is whether the express language in this commercial contract, which was a non-exclusive broker's agreement, uh, precludes as a matter of law, any claim by the uh, broker, the respondent here, to commissions in this case. And, and, and I suggest respectfully that even if arguendo the seller, my client improperly terminated this agreement early, there still would be no right to commissions because of the precise words in this uh, agreement. And this court has for many, many years now actually been uh, stalwart in defending the uh, integrity of express provisions in commercial contracts that are uh, negotiated in, uh, in, with uh, sophisticated parties uh, with the assistance of counsel. And if we look at the actual contract language here, it is, it is in my uh, view, respectfully, impossible to find a way that these particular brokers are entitled to a commission in this case. Well, your, and, your uh, client makes, uh, uh, takes issue with the uh, uh, assessment that he terminated this agreement. Is yes. that still your position? It is our position if we have to get to it, but I don't want to even go well, you there. Have to I, I get will to assume. It. I, I will Trust assume. Me you have to get to it. Okay. <laughs> I will assume for the purpose of this argument that there was a wrongful termination uh, because I don't think it matters. I think if you take a look at the actual facts here, is well, if, if, as they may it, be. it does matter because if someone is terminated prior to their ability to con to finish the work that they have started, then you have interfered with the very uh, contract that and uh, that they entered into. Your Honor, that's not correct in this case. That's the prevention doctrine. It's an old doctrine. It basically says you can't frustrate a condition that is necessary for the performance of a contract. But the law is very clear that that prevention doctrine doesn't uh, excuse uh, non-performance uh, where there you were permitted to uh, prevent the condition from happening by the very words in the contract itself. So it, 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 as uh, this is how uh, Wilson put it, the doctrine of prevention as an excuse for non-performance of a contract duty is inapplicable when the contract alleged to have prevented performance was permissible under the express terms of a contract. And that's what happened here. If you take a look at there So are, what language are you relying on that allowed him to terminate the contract willy-nilly? Well, it's not willy-nilly. It was right in a, it, the agreement was very clear. Uh, it says, and it, it's, there are four uh, parts of this contract. 
it, and it says in, in paragraph five of the contract that broker fully understands and acknowledges and agrees that the seller reserves the right to determine any and all terms of the conditions of the sale to the designated purchaser and to accept, reject, count offers and negotiate in its sole and absolute discretion any and all prices, terms, contracts, et cetera. Seller shall be free to accept or reject any deal under any circumstances for any reasons. Okay. So this, yeah, and it's important to, to understand why this is here. This is a very- But how does that, how is that language relevant since, uh, since under the, the facts here, uh, your client terminated him before he was able to to bring forth a, a, a set deal. Well, there's two issues, there's two answers to that. One has to do with the contract itself, which specifically says, if for any reason whatsoever, including but not limited to the acts, omissions, negligence, or willful default of the seller, the contract shall not that a contract shall not be entered into prior to the expiration of the term, then no commission fee or other compensation or any portion thereof shall be deemed to be due or earned by the broker under this agreement or otherwise. And the seller, my client, shall be relieved from all liabilities to the broker for the payment of any and all commissions or any other compensation. What, what the trial, what the court below said was clearly uh, in as much as the section precludes recovery of a commission, even in the event of a willful default, the court there said you had to read this in the context of the entire agreement. And there was a provision in section one of the agreement that basically says that the agreement uh, can be terminated for cause, uh, uh, but you first have to give 10 days notice as an opportunity to, to cure. Right. And the, the trial judge or the court below said on motion that in order to make both of these uh, two provisions uh, operate meaningfully within the contract, that that somehow supersedes the, the willful default uh, waiver uh, that I just read. And it doesn't because they, they deal with two uh, different things. Uh, for example, under under one, let's assume for the moment that we breached All one. Right, you're going to have to make this quick because you are already out of time. So I'll give you another 30 seconds. All right. The bottom line is that, that provision, the termination provision, is has a meaning independent from what was said in the um, in, in in paragraph four that I just read, and that is that if for some reason we wrongfully terminate, then if the deal ended within the contract term, it would have the 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 the, uh, the plaintiff here would have been entitled to a commission. So, Mr. Montclair, are you saying because I, I believe that in this particular case, the contract of sale was not entered into until November of 2016, which was after the time that the contract. Uh, would have uh, uh, would have ended even if it had not been wrongfully terminated, and there was no closing until September 2019. So, are you saying that under any circumstances, based on this, there was just no way he could get 50 percent anything, and that's why you're conceding that maybe there was a wrongful termination? Is that your point? Yes, that's the point because the wrongful termination doesn't uh, should not trump the provision that says they're not entitled to a commission under any circumstances, even the wrongful conduct of my client. And the reason for that is it's still meaningful because if it was, if they were wrongfully terminated uh, and the, and the deal happened within the contract term, they would be entitled to a commission. Maybe That's 50, not yeah. what happened at so all. You, so, but un under your scenario, then uh, uh, a, a, uh, a, a seller could, uh, wrongfully terminate, and all they have to do is wait for the contractual time period to end in order to not have any obligation. That's what Under you're saying. Under this agreement, yes, but that's not what happened here. There were negotiations for nine months after this particular termination uh, allegation is, you know, takes place, 
And during that nine months, there was constant negotiation. And there's not a hint that there was anything phony or false or delayed. In fact, in August of that year, and I know I'm running out of time, and this is all in the brief, but Thank in August of that you. year. Way that, out of time. He's eating up his rebuttal time. Go ahead. I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll wait till rebut. But I also, right. there are many, many issues, so I want to rely on the brief. But I just wanted to point out that one, that one issue. Mr. Richardson, you have five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, George Richardson of Sullivan and Worcester on behalf of the respondents. Uh, Mr. Montclair told you this afternoon that he, he wants you to focus on the language of the broker, brokerage agreement. And that's the same thing that he says uh, that, that, that appellants say in their briefs. Look at the language in, in, in the contract. They want you to look at that, but, but as, as you pointed out, Your Honor, the one thing they want to ignore is the termination provision. And it's the fact that appellants wrongfully terminated the brokerage agreement that led to the entry of summary judgment against them. In their reply brief, appellants make the argument- Counsel, hey. counsel this is Judge Owing. It's only summary of judgment as the liability. If this goes to, in terms of damages, whether or not you're entitled to any money, that's still to be tried, correct? Correct. So, so that, that responds to Mr. Montclair's argument about how you're not entitled to any money because the contract terms preclude you from any recovery. That may be well and true, but that's going to be tried. I think that is the import of, of the lower court's decision. Right. Yes, sir. It's just a matter of liability that we're talking about. And, and the way I read this is that they didn't terminate the contract in accordance. They didn't tell your client what your client was doing wrong for your client to correct the, the errors that of his ways. Right. I mean, so that was sim plain and simple. Uh, that, that's certainly correct, uh, Justice Owen. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, let me ask sure. you a question. Uh, I couldn't, th this property was sold for upwards of $60 million? Yes, sir. So that, you know, the whole argument is, uh, from what I read from Mr. D'Alessandro's affidavit, was that your client gummed up the works so that he wasn't going to maximize this deal. Is the upwards of $60 million not maximizing the deal? Did he fall short of what he thought he was going to be able to get? No, uh, he, he did not, or at least, Justice Oink, there is no evidence in the record. They, they make the simple statement that the supposed disclosure by Mr. Della Valle right. of, of the supposed confidential information right. harmed them. Uh, no, but, but, they, he, but, but I think I read in the record where Mr. D'Alessandro made edits to that letter or whatever, that email that went to, to, to the other side, right, to relate it. So that there was the, 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 that he was sort of understanding that there was going to be a disclosure somewhere. I thought I read that somewhere. Maybe I'm wrong. Yes. Okay. Yes, you did. Uh, what that's talking about is the term sheet that was was right. sent over in 2014, and Mr. Right. Delisandro's son Billy, uh, who is an attorney, did edit that document. Right. So th that was one of the arguments against the fact that it was confidential information. I mean, was this the whole point about making the 1031 exchanges and getting some apartments for the payment? I mean, the way that they were going to make the deal and whether that slipped out because of your client or it came out from, you know, in some prior negotiation, right? Uh, uh, well, yeah, in the earlier term, she, that, that's exactly right. Um, but Justice Kapnick, the, the point there is that um, there was no evidence at all, uh, and the trial court so found, that Mr. Della Valle had disclosed that information. The only basis in the record for that, that, that um, allegation is Mr. Delisandro's affidavit, and in there he only speculated. And in fact, uh, Ms., the uh, appellant's counsel at, the, at Mr. Della Valle's deposition never even asked him the question of what, what was said in that telephone conversation. But we also took the deposition of Jay Cross, who was the president of Hudson Yards, and Mr. Montclair did ask him if you talked about, if, if he and Mr. Della Valle talked about a 1031 transaction. And, and Mr. Cross said he didn't recall any such discussion. Um, and so that's why, actually, the, the trial court uh, dis, 
to disregard it on four separate bases why the disclosure, why confidential information being disclosed wasn't a valid reason to terminate the contract. Okay. Thank um, you so much. Do you have anything else? Mr. Richardson. Uh, I, I, I could talk about this case all, all day, Your Honor. I'm sure you could, but we have a lot more cases to hear. So I thank I you. We understand your position. Mr. Montclair, you have one minute. Yes, and I want to do it very quickly. Um, there is no issue as to whether or not we were damaged by the, uh, the, the disclosure. That We're not suing what for damage. What disclosure? The disclosure of the strategy with regard to the 10 Council, come strategy. on. That, 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 that to me was the most ridiculous argument because the, the buyers well, didn't notice that there was only one piece of property left. Come on. No, no respectfully, Your Honor, this, is, this was a, a very complicated deal. And the idea was to get a cash price for $60 million or $70 million. This is not an unusual aspect of these type of deals. This, this is not so unusual. Well, right. This is I, done I, all the time. This, I don't, I, as I said, I don't think we need to get to that point. Uh, but I will say this, that um, the, the rule is very clear that in order there for there to be causation, you have to say that but for the breach, in this case, the termination of the, uh, of, of the broker, that the broker would have made the commission. And there is no evidence that the broker would have made this commission had he not been terminated. In fact, the broker did nothing for the entire time. He, he had a couple of emails and a couple of telephone conversations. The deal that we ultimately struck uh, was not even on the horizon at the time of the termination. There is no possibility that this particular um, uh, broker can argue, and they really don't, that the deal well, would have been done you may, you, you may still win at the trial level uh, on the damages because that, you know, is still out there. Yeah, but I don't think, you know, Judge Kaplan, with respectfully, I don't think we need to go to trial on that issue because the contract is so clear that they are not entitled to those kinds of damages, period. Um, and I think- Thank you. All right, thank you. You are way out of time, sir. <laughs> thank okay, you. Thank you very much afternoon. for your time. I appreciate Reddish it. Reddish versus Adler. Uh, counsel for Dr. Adler, Mr. Cassion. Cassino. Cassino? Can, can the court hear me? Yes. Okay, How do you thanks. pronounce your name? It's Cassino. Cassino. Oh, that, okay. Yes. That, you have five minutes. Out there. Uh, you thank you, Your Honor. The, the uh, I'm sorry, my volume's a little low. Okay. You're good. Okay. The, the plaintiff's predominant theory a trial as to Dr. Sibitaro and Dr. Stumacher related to the fact that they did not either seek or recommend a transfer to Columbia Presbyterian for ECMO treatment, which in December 2010 was a cutting edge technology with very limited ability. Um, the plaintiffs didn't make a prima facie case of, negligence, of, of malpractice with this for two specific reasons. One, there's no evidence that seeking a transfer for ECMO was a standard of care in December 2010. Or two, that the plaintiff would actually have been accepted for by Isn't Columbia. Dr. Press Adler, the doctor who um, left a note to uh, to give her fluids without any kind of specific uh, recommendation. Well, well, okay, Your Honor, Isn't I was he that doctor. I, I'm t I'm talking about Dr. S I have Dr. Sibitaro, Dr. Stumacher, and Dr. Adler, and I'm happy to talk about Dr. Adler. Um, because the claims against him, there, there's no, the claims against him do not relate to the ECMO. The claims against him relate to the a December 6th note that he left, which said that the note, the entire note itself said, follow urine output and fluid bolus as needed. Um, the doc, the doctor, uh, the plaintiff's expert, Dr. Silverman, opined that and this so, note was- So that decision was, was to be left to nurses to decide how much fluid she should get? No, Your Honor, when Dr. Silverman uh, re kept on re reading the note to the jury, he kept on saying fluid, fluid bolus as needed. He did not read the entire note. The entire note says, follow urine output and fluid bolus as needed. Why is that important? It's important because at the time that he wrote the note, there was no way for him to know how much fluid to give to the plaintiff because the, they didn't know what her urine out output was going to be. Um, so uh, Dr. again, Adler, so so did the, was the nurse 
Yeah. I'm assuming the nurses are the ones who have to uh, uh, abide by that note. So the nurses have to determine what the ratio of urine output to how much fluid she gets. They decide that. Well, Your Honor, the, the plaintiff required fluid. I think everybody could agree here. Counsel, Doctor, I'm so asking you a very direct question. Yes. So well, is it the, the nurse who decides what the proper ratio between urine output and fluid intake is? Um, well, there is other, after Dr. Uh, after Dr. S um, Adler goes off, there is then another attending physician. They do 12 hour shifts. So there is another attending physician in the ICU. Um, but the, the problem is here, yet even if even assuming that this note is ambiguous, there's no claim that she received an excessive amount of fluid. She gained 83 pounds <laughs> in five days. It, it, exactly, Your Honor. The reason so why- I, I'm sorry, that is not normal under any measure. Your Honor, I agree with you. But what happened is you have to look at the entire history of what happened here. He wrote that note on December 6th. On December 7th, the plaintiff underwent this inhalation anesthesia, which, you know, because it was a, this, it's a procedure whereby we take her into the operating room, we give her paralytics, we, you know, we basically sedate, we, we put her under anesthesia in the hope that that could break this bronchospasm so that the lungs could start functioning normally. What happened was during that first round of inhalation anesthesia, she became critically hypertensive, her blood pressure crashed, and then the, the, the doctor who was performing that, and that, and that by the way, is an accepted risk, that's a, that's a normal risk of the procedure that happens sometimes, unfortunately. They brought her back to the, they brought her back to the ICU, and then they had to administer f her fluids because of the, um, because the 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 hypertension the, the because her blood pressure went down so low, so this idea that she gained these eighty pounds because of doctors Adler's note is completely it's it's I, not. I didn't supportive. say that. Excuse just me. To be clear, I didn't say that. Oh, okay, but you did mention the eighty, so that's why. But yes, I, but I just because I, I, <laughs> the woman is blowing up right in front of everybody's eyes. Exactly. Yes, the woman starts. She's blowing up in front of people's eyes, and yes, by December tenth. She did gain 80 pounds, but there's no indication that any of that weight that she gains and any of that excessive fluid um, is due to Dr. Adler's note. And I would just point out that, yes, while the, the fact that she gains this weight is it's very unsettling, I'm sure it's it sounds horrible. Unfortunately, because this it is horrible. Um, excuse me. It sounds horrible because it is horrible. Exact. Well, Your Honor, the plaintiff came in. This was an extremely, extremely, extremely sick woman. And this hospital in St. Barnabas threw everything that they had at her. And yes, it does. It's, our decisions made, would, would the preference have been to not give her that, that amount of fluid? Of course. But her blood pressure was critically low. Otherwise, she was going to start losing blood perfusion to the organs. Her kidneys were failing. They had to do something, which is why they then, which is, you know, and again, this all, this is all, has a lot of this fluid here. Most of this fluid here has absolutely nothing to do with Dr. Adler's note. Dr. Silverman was repeatedly asked during, was, was asked on cross-examination, can you point to any entries in the note where you're, in, in the plaintiff's medical record, where you're pointing, you're 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 assigning the administration of supposedly excessive fluid to this note, and there never was any. He was never able to identify that, and he also doesn't identify any other way to treat her. You know, again, this was not our de desire to do this. This was mandated by her condition, and the plaintiff has never said that you know that there was some other way to possibly treat this woman. Like I said, she came in; she was extremely sick. Her, her Why blood was pressure. the dialysis delayed for so long? Uh, that when goes it was clearly to, indicated. That is with Doctor. Um, that's with Doctor Ahmad. That's my co-defendant who's going to be speaking. Okay, after. I'll ask him that question then. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so I would, and and again, Doctor Doctor Silverman acknowledges that fluid resuscitation is an appropriate treatment. And you know, again, we're in the ICU, and it gets ugly sometimes. But unfortunately. Decisions have to be made, and that you know we had to we had to do this not because we wanted to, but because her condition required it. Um, so if I if you won't mind, uh, I just want to just walk, walk back quickly and talk about the ECMO. Go ahead. Okay. You have about a minute left. <clears throat> okay, that's fine, Your Honor. 
that the plaintiff never established that a transfer to, to was a standard of care. We're not talking about whether or not ECMO was a standard of care um, for a plaintiff with asthma in, in 2010 for a patient with asthma. That's not the question. St. Barnabas did not have an ECMO machine. This, the question here is whether or not the- She would have had to be transferred to Columbia. That was where they had it, correct? Exactly. They had it. But here's the thing, Your Honor. Dr. Silverman testified that, that there was a quote unquote good chance or good likelihood that the Columbia team would have had a portable or mini ECMO. How does Dr. Silverman, if that this is this is at a 2019 trial, how does he know that? And he's asked about that. He says he recalls reading something specific that was published in 2011, maybe. We well, submitted but except that Dr. Stuhlmacher admitted that in 2010, he was aware of this ECMO treatment. Yes, Your Honor. So aware? it's not like, you know, it may not have been quote unquote, the standard of care, but he was aware of it. Your Honor, again, you can't, for, for somebody who needs ECMO treatment, you can't just put them in an, in, a, a, uh, in an ambulance and ship them over the bridge to Columbia and then hook them up in Columbia. So the, Columbia has to accept them. They have to be transferred in a ECMO equipped ambulance. Okay, the plaintiff never put in any evidence that she would have been accepted by Columbia as an asthma patient. That's a huge thing because if all, if the, on, the only question, the, the, the question that was put to the jury is whether or not they departed from the standard of care by not seeking a, a transfer. You could seek a transfer all you want, but if Columbia decides we're not taking this patient, then that the, the, the mere fact that you didn't make a phone but, call- But you're, you're <laughs> arguing, your argument, in essence, is don't don't blame us for not asking whether we could transfer her because there's no way for us to know whether they would have accepted her. No, Your Honor. The a the plaintiff never put in evidence for the plaintiff to connect the circle on proximate cause. They have to establish some sort of departure by us to some sort of change in her treatment that would have led in a, that would have led to a different result. The plaintiff's expert says, yeah, they should have transferred her, or they should have tried to transfer her. But we don't control the transfer. Um, but that, that, but you that, would have to set but, it in motion for it to happen, no? Well, I agree. Wouldn't the, but St. Barnabas job, have I to thought, call in order? Wouldn't St. Barnabas have to initiate that call in order for a transfer to happen? Exactly, Your Honor. But if we make that call and Columbia Presbyterian says, I'm sorry, no, then what is the, then, then the then fact that the Then at least you not, tried. But you didn't make the call. <laughs> no, I understand that. But you know what, Your Honor? You know, did you during the the trial we put in the deposition? We had Dr. Cunningham, who was actually involved in creating the the intake procedure at Columbia Presbyterian for ECMO referrals, and she testified that by 2010 there was only, we only had two asthma patients who re, who received ECMO uh, for you know for asthma. Both were originally both originally treated at Columbia. Only one out of every four outside referrals are accepted. The factors which are considered for referral acceptance are best defined for ARDS, which is a very different condition than than uh, than than, um, than than asthma. She didn't consider the the ECMO to be the standard of care, and the only transport surgeon that they had. I mean, the, the program has grown since then, but the only transport surgeon they had at the time of this treatment was on active duty and either in Afghanistan or and possibly in a, either Afghanistan or or Iraq. So. Not we didn't have a burden on this, at, you know, at, at trial, it was the plaintiff's burden to show. All that, right, I got it. OK, we're, we're way over time and I've got to move on. Thank you, uh, Mr. Weinberg. Good Five afternoon, minutes. Your Honor. Seth Weinberg with Marlo in the party for Dr. Ahmed. And I had an opening statement, but I know Judge Manzanet has a question for me. So I'll yes. just start with that. Yes. T explain to me why there was such a delay in dialysis because Dr. Ahmed recommended giving Lasix on the 10th. And the one thing that did not come out in this case is testimony from any doctor that it was a departure from the standard of care to recommend Lasix. So for example, Dr. Silverman, plaintiff's expert was asked, question, okay, do you disagree with the recommendation of Lasix? Answer, I have no opinion. Dr. Stumacher? Well, it, it seems to me that that the issue is not whether Lasix would have been an appropriate recommendation as a starter. For me, the question is whether that recommendation came early enough and whether at the point in time, it was already too late for Lasix and you now have to just go straight to dialysis before the kidney shuts down. 
No one, no one has said that, Your Honor. We first saw this patient on December 10th. The first thing we did was recommend Lasix. No one has said that it was a departure to do that at that time. So if the and first- how, how, long, how long was Lasix um, to be uh, tried before uh, uh, dialysis would have been the go-to treatment? I believe 24 hours, but don't hold me to it, Your Honor. When we showed up the next day, we found out that our suggestion was not followed by the ICU staff. And I would point out, no one called us, said, hey, we're not giving Lasix tonight. Come back and do dialysis. The pulmonologist who plaintiff will make a big point about, his note says, do dialysis early. First off, Dr. Silverman doesn't know what early means. No one knows what early means. But beyond that, the pulmonologist- Well, it's not after the afternoon. No, it, if it's I hear not early, Saturday, something no. early, I think the morning. That would be the next morning because we saw her two hours later after the pulmonologist. And that, that would mean December 11th, the next morning, which is what Dr. Stumacher said early means in his mind, one to three hours, one to three days, I apologize. And I point out that, days? that Dr. Stumacher, who is the attending physician, said he felt that dialysis could wait one to three days. So when we came back the next day and Lasix was not administered, we did it that morning. And I point out that the dialysis forms recommended by the physician who wrote early are non-emergent forms of dialysis. So this physician didn't write dialysis ASAP, didn't write dialysis STAT, and then he recommended forms of dialysis that don't need to be done on an emergent basis. And plaintiff comes forth with no evidence from any physician who says it was a departure to recommend Lasix on December 10th. And the error in judgment rule that all doctors live by is if there are two acceptable courses, there is no liability when one is selected over the other. And here we have two acceptable courses. We have dialysis immediately and Lasix, and no one has said it was improper to give Lasix. So at that point, unless someone is going to come in and testify, you could not give Lasix on the 10th. You cannot give Lasix and then do dialysis the next day. They cannot say it's a departure to do the course of action that's potentially proper. So if the court hasn't, I'm sorry, Judge Bezat, do you have a question? Go ahead. No, I was going to say, if you have no other questions on departure, I was going to move on to proximate cause. Go right ahead. Thank you. Dr. Silverman never, I didn't want to use the word pinpoint because I don't want to make it seem like I'm holding the plaintiff to a higher burden. No one established the simple question of, was the brain injury beyond avoidance when we first saw her on December 10th? Dr. Silverman says it after being dragged out of him four times on direct, a lunch break and everything else, but he doesn't know when the brain injury started to develop. All he could say is it started to develop several days before the seizure. He doesn't consider that the ICU was closed and we couldn't force Lasix. He doesn't consider, doesn't know why Lasix was not given. And he's not gonna say that we shouldn't have given Lasix. So if he cannot say that the, he knows about the underlying facts of this treatment and the critical facts of the treatment Dr. Ahmed rendered, and he can't well, say when the injury started, didn't Dr. Excuse me, Judge Mazzarelli, didn't Dr. Stumacher say, testify that and concede that the brain injury was the result of a prolonged hyper, hypercapnia, the acidosis? Uh, <clears throat> didn't he concede that or that was a prolonged condition? Well, that's the point. Prolonged. When in the prolonged condition did it become unavoidable? And plaintiff is relying on the loss of chance doctrine, which was raised for the first time in opposition to a post-trial motion, along with, by the way, asking the court to take judicial notice of FDA articles about whether Lasix is proper. But even with loss of chance, you have to say when the treatment was rendered, there was still a chance for a better outcome because the injury had not reached a point of no return, so to speak. Well, Dr. Stumacher saw the plaintiff on December 10 and then not again until December 18. And that's when he talked about the prolonged uh, uh, condition. So those eight days are critical here. Those are the eight days after dialysis. And we don't know 
because she was getting fluid to Judge Manson's next point well in advance of December 10th, if it was already happened before December 10th. When the condition is the same essentially throughout her admission, there's no way to know. And it's at some point, all we needed Dr. Silverman to say was, I can say it happened before Decem after December 10th because. And he well, aren't there notes because. about whether or not, she, I mean, when you're in the hospital, they talk to you. They make notes about whether or not you can respond if you're aware of time, place, uh, if you're oriented as to time and place. Every day they make those notes, this, sometimes three times a day. But this patient was in a medically induced coma until the 14th when we discovered the seizure. And that's the first time anyone thought she had a brain injury. And that's when she was sent for an MRI. So the point is we have an intubated, medically comatose patient who's under this condition for an extended period of time. And Dr. Silverman says, if you had done it on, if you'd done dialysis on the 10th, this wouldn't have happened. But when you go to ask, well, why doctor? We don't know. And then when you dump it in with, he's not willing to say it was improper to try Lasix on December 10th. You can't, how can you say it's approximate cause on dialysis when he didn't consider the actual course of treatment recommended and an expert opinion that's not premised on the actual facts of care, carries no weight as a matter of law. So I just want to touch one back thing, one very quickly, and, and then I'm assuming I'm not over my time, Judge Manzanet. You're very, very close. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. With regard to the LASIX administration, I would just ask this court to reject plaintiff's invitation to take judicial notice of FDA publications that were submitted for the first time in opposition to a post-trial motion. And I'd ask this court to think about why a plaintiff's counsel would do that if their expert met the burden of establishing a departure from the standard of care. You would not ask a court to take judicial notice of an FDA opinion and ask a court to come to a medical opinion and conclusion that the physician plaintiff called couldn't make if you thought your doctor did the job and explained why dialysis was inappropriate on the 10th. So I, I hope thank I didn't go you. too over my time, Judge Manzanet, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Buckley. Oh, muted. You're muted. Can't hear you. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, William Buckley of Garberini and Shear for St. Barnabas Hospital. As the court knows, what we have to look for here in assessing the plaintiff's pain and suffering is guided by 5501C and the Don Lane case. What's happened, we look to similar verdicts and awards for pain and suffering. What's happening is we're not looking at similar well, the pain and suffering. Well, the Donlin case is a, a rather old case. Uh, yep. And maybe we should look to the dissent in Donlin, because I think the dissent in Donlin presages the uh, status of the law right now. Uh, but we still look, Your Honor, to the statute, which is comparable verdicts. Now, what's happened here is- Of course we do. And in Donlin, the majority reduced the damages from 400,000 to 500,000, right? That's true. Yes, Your Honor, I'm going to have an editor. I happen to be familiar with the case. I know you're right, Your Honor. And the dissent you are. And, and now, you know, I mean, the cases we have now don't even, that, that's not even an approximation of what the damages are in, in, in brain injury cases now. And Donlin wasn't a brain injury case. Donlin was a back injury case Correct. of a fireman. But it still holds the same legal precedent that we look to comparable cases of pain and, and suffering. we do that. You know we do yeah, that. I know we do that. Every time we have a case, we what, do what's it. Your Honor, what's happening in the plaintiff's brief, though, is the plaintiff is dancing around all different kinds of injuries that are not an analysis of comparable injuries to a plaintiff has suffered here. First of all, most of the cases that we talk about with brain injuries in the briefs are traumatic brain injuries. Here, the plaintiff didn't suffer a traumatic brain injury. She suffered a brain insult because of lack of oxygen while she was in the hospital. She Does it only really make a difference if her the, the resulting <laughs> conditions are, well, are somewhat better. similar? If we look Does at it the, make a difference if she can't ambulate because of a traumatic brain injury or the, the type of a brain injury that you're talking about? What difference yes. does that make? The difference is, Your Honor, we look at the social circumstances and change of life the plaintiff has. But also this court, for example, in Hedges has written a, a decision around how awful the situation was that gave rise to the injuries. They describe the, the case describes a I lot of Hedges. I was on that bench. I, 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 know, Hedges, I, would, I yes. know Hedges very well. Yes. 
All right. And what's happened? Judge Kaplick, I think, was too, or Judge Owen, right? right? Yes, we were. I think we're all on it. Okay, but Judge Owen was on uh, Perez also. Yes, exactly. Which I'm sure plaintiff is going to raise. But in those situations, we you, the court talked a lot about the in, the injury and how the injury happened to occur as far as the changes in plaintiff's life. Well, excuse me, but if a woman comes into the hospital having gained 83 pounds in five days and goes through all of the procedures that she went through with no benefit whatsoever, does it really make a? I don't I don't understand your argument. I in a way, to me, it's more outrageous. She's in the hospital and she's not being helped rather than that she's the, the subject of some kind of, of a traumatic accident or injury or, or what a crime, however you want to characterize it. I mean, here is this woman sitting there in the hospital and nothing is being done. I mean, to me, it's, it's absolutely puzzling, the 83 pounds of weight gain in five days, that this didn't trigger some kind of really very extreme dramatic action on, on well, the part of the people treating her. Your Honor, this was the ninth uh, admission this patient had for asthma in the past two years. What so happened? What? So what? The well, the hospital saved her life. You, you can't characterize so the case. So the what? That it was her ninth time. The point is, she is gravely ill, and the point she is, is that she is an asthmatic. We yes, have thousands and thousands, millions of asthmatic in this country. Yes, many people die from it. What, what's happened here is, in this particular case. St. Barnabas saved her life and the resulting pain and suffering that she has. She's never described having physical pain since she woke up. But, but the thing is, her life is really not much of anything. I mean, she says that she can watch television and she's wheelchair bound. She can't walk. She can read. I mean, what kind of life is that? She can wipe her butt. I mean, that was very, you know, just so upsetting to read that she really can do almost nothing um, in her life. I mean, just reading and watching television for the rest of her life doesn't, uh, you know, bode anything, you know, exciting in her life. It, it, it's a terrible life to be left to. And I think didn't the, um, the life care planner did testify that she was totally disabled and she would need 24 hour um, care for the rest of her life. And the she, jury found that she had a life expectancy of 34.5 years, even if they're off a little bit. It's a very long life with very little to look forward to. Yeah, yes, Your Honor, but all the people that are receiving awards in similar situations, no one's getting anything near $30 million, all right? The highest award came out about three weeks ago when this court gave $20 million to somebody who has a seizure disorder following what happened. But here, this patient does live at home with her family. Her attorney said that she goes to restaurants with them. She, the, the basic injuries here are that she has a thick tongue. She has pretty good cognition, her own expert has said. When it comes to, she can find the words that she needs, but has difficulty pronouncing them. She is in a wheelchair, but the point is she can take a few steps at a time, but she is not in the same situation as people who need nursing home care. And she is not, and the people who are getting- She will need nursing home care eventually. Well, perhaps she will. Because her parents, uh, you know, uh, are, are not likely to outlive her. Correct. So she will end up in a nursing home with no one to care for her. Yeah. Okay, albeit that's speculative, but we can look at that particular situation. So is your speculation. But the point is, Your Honor, people are getting awards of $3 million to $10 million for similar injuries, not $30 million. And I therefore would ask the court to uh, keep note of that. Um, as far as the collateral source, the court um, down below ignored the fact that St. Barnabas did present information about disability applications that plaintiff made. So I'd ask the court to please allow us to have a, a collateral source here. Thank you. Mr. Isaac, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I have a lot to comment on, um, but I'm going to try to do it quickly and not You've go- You've got 10 oh, minutes. I got <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I, I've heard from all three attorneys how critically ill the plaintiff was, but people who are in the hospitals are critically ill. And unless I'm missing something, in the seminal case King against St. Barnabas Hospital, this court dealt with that very issue. And it said, the motion court was of the view that the decedent, found in a life-threatening, non-responsive state, was in some sense destined to die, and therefore that any departures from the resuscitation protocols by the first responders were of no import. However, we cannot endorse a rule that would essentially absolve first responders of liability where they deviate from life support protocols. 
The evidence in this case regarding liability, in my view, my humble view, was overwhelming. 83 pounds in five days? Let me give you the visual, because I'm into visuals today because of my earlier argument. Look at me right now, I'm 170 pounds. Close your eyes, picture me at 253. You're not gonna know I'm Brian Isaac. You're not gonna know who I am. That's in five days. And the testimony, as uh, I think Judge Kapnick and Judge Mazzarelli alluded to, was that this was an injury that took place over time. Let me give you the page references. Stumacher would testify 206. Plaintiff's brain injury was caused by prolonged exposure to hypercapnia and acidosis. Dr. Adler, 442, testified that brain damage was caused by pro uh, pro progressive exposure to CO2. At 345 and 221, again, Adler and Stumacher, excessive hydration and low BP over time meant that plaintiff's organs were getting less oxygen. So every one of these theories was supported. Now let's talk about Dr. Ahmed, just give me a minute. My adversary says that Dr. Silverman's testimony is no good. I don't even need his testimony with respect to the failure to do the hemodialysis. Why? Here's what the resident said. This is his resident. Quote, if no urine output will need hemodialysis. Dr. Dr. Kobiter, I think I have his name right, writes, and I'm quoting, fluid overload needs to be treated with hemodialysis early. What happened was Dr. Ahmed countermanded his resident's note, wrote over it, and then said we'd give Lasix. Now, why didn't they give Lasix? Dr. Stumacher said so. And what he said, despite what my adversaries say, is that he couldn't give it because it wasn't indicated. 280, 283. Well, they didn't do anything. They didn't do the Lasix, nor did they do the dialysis. Am I correct? That's correct. They, they, this is this this is a case of complete inaction. That's the problem. You had somebody who was critically ill, and there wasn't any action. You had ambiguous notes. Three get gallons of fluid were being given when you didn't need to give gallons. Uh, you know, and I'm a prevailing party. And with respect to the ECMO, I have to tell you. I was a little troubled by the fact that the the motion that they made that led to the 2018 decision wasn't put in. But I do want to read what Judge Capella said, because this is absolutely incredible. This is in his decision. It's 2018. Is this New York part of the record, sir? Huh? Is it's in the record. record. Yes, it is. This is his decision. So it, 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 this is a printed decision. This is what he found. The defendants should have put it into the record. They didn't. We did. But listen to this. Dr. Silverman also notes that three of the defendants, Dr. Cubitaro, Dr. Adler, and Dr. Stumacher, and George Masrelli, I think you, you alluded to this, acknowledged in their deposition transcripts that they knew of the existence of an ECMO program in Manhattan, and at least one of them admitted that if it were available, they may have been able to save the plaintiff from her brain damage. That's not Brian Isaac. That's and, and that was Judge Manzanet, but it's okay. Judge Mazzarelli and I get confused all the time. <laughs> I apologize. but It's so, okay. <laughs> so, so, and this notion that a critically injured plaintiff, like this plaintiff, who had too much carbon dioxide in her body and was, was had, had acid, acidosis, too little, her pH was going down, that she wouldn't have actually been eligible for the ECMO it makes no sense. The ECMO, ECMO therapy is perfect for her. It puts oxygen in the blood. Well, if it wasn't tried, if they didn't try to get her in, we, we don't know. That's correct. I mean, there was never any testimony they wouldn't do it. And the inference is that they would do it. Why would well, I? I, th I thought that the doctor testified that he never considered transferring her there anyway, even That's though they correct. did know about it. They never did consider that. I believe That's that correct. was testimony. And that and, and that that's that's at page 227 of the record, which is why the error it, which is why the uh, error in judgment charge is not applicable because you can't make an error in judgment when you never think about about actually transferring someone. So I think all of the theories are supported. I think that the uh, arguments about the summation error, which nobody even raises because it's not preserved, and the charge is okay. But I do want to talk about damages. Normally, I don't. It is absolutely true, I think, that Judge Mazzarelli, the dissent in Donlin, has now come kind of full circle. I'm going to focus Thank a little, you. Not, not, not only on the defendants, but I've got amicus brief after amicus brief after amicus brief here saying that you really can't award more than $10 million for these injuries. But look what happened. You have Hedges, which is a TBI, and then you have Perez, 
and the, the numbers go to 13 million. Well, Hedges and Perez are different cases with different injuries, uh, more extreme injuries. Uh, and in Perez in particular, is a very young person. Um, in, in Hedges, you have someone who, who is in, totally incontinent. That's that, that, that's true. Except, let me. I do want to point something out with regard to that, if I can. I know you're familiar with the case because I know many of you were on it. I read the briefs the other day. This is what I got from the Perez brief, and this is from this is from the record. Plaintiff there exercises daily, works out at a gym three to four times a week, lived alone and drove a car for three years post accident, can bathe and dress himself, can fix mechanical problems around his parents' house because he's pretty good with his hands. My client can't do any of that. He can walk more than several blocks. Whose his- brief is that? Huh? Whose brief is that in Perez? That was from that was from the defendants. I'm I'm quoting from the think so, yes. Right. No, but I'm not I'm not suggesting that that listen, I am a plaintiff's guy. I'm certainly not suggesting that they didn't underestimate the briefs, but that was from the record. So what I'm saying is I don't have the cognitive problems that that uh, the Perez plaintiff had because that's the point. She's fully cognizant of what she can do, but she can't do anything. And the reason she can't do anything is because they use the word discoordination. It's a word I never heard before, but she can't She can't even stand. Dr. Root said she can stand up, take a step, she has to go down. She can't bathe herself. Mr. Isaac, how old is she right now? Remind me. She was 40 at the time. Uh, she was 40 at the time of the incident. There was 8.5, uh, 8.5 years of past pain and suffering. As okay. you pointed out, 34.5 years of future pain and suffering. And the Perez plaintiff had, I think, six to seven years of past pain and suffering, and to be fair, 43 years of future pain and suffering. But my client's condition is certainly not going to get better. And even though cognitively she's not as bad as the Perez plaintiff, in terms of her activities of daily living, she's much worse than she was. So we think that the judge's, what, two-thirds reduction of the jury verdict was acceptable here, given what her life is like. And I think, Judge Kaplan, because you pointed out, one of the highlights of her life is being able to wipe herself. That's a pretty bad life compared to what she had before, where she was a pillar of the community, a PTA president. She took care of the family. She danced. She was a fully actuated human being. And now she's basically someone who needs to get her house completely fixed because she can't because her her, her wheelchair, which she has to stay in, she can't do anything. So I just think that given your decisional law and given what's happened with respect to brain injuries, the trial judge's reduction was appropriate, and I'd ask you not to reduce it any further if, if you could. If you don't have any questions, I know it's late. I'm happy to rest on my brief with everything else. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, and now rebuttal. Uh, Mr. Casino, you have two yeah, minutes. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'll, I'll be brief. I just want to talk about the ECMO for a second. I understand that we didn't try it, um, but that does not relieve the plaintiff of their burden of establish of basically putting in an expert who's going to test identify what would have happened um, had we had we sought a transfer. I mean that's the that's the essence of a proximate cause argument is that a plaintiff's expert is always talking about basically an alternate reality, an alternate hypothetical where the the, the healthcare providers did act in the way that the plaintiff's expert is saying that they should have. So we, in a typical medical, in a medical malpractice case, a plaintiff, you know, a plaintiff can't say, I don't have to say what would have happened had, you know, X or X, Y, Z treatment been tried because it wasn't tried. No, they have to say, but for the fact that this wasn't tried, this is, you know, had this actually been tried, this is what would have happened. So I would just take issue with that. And I would say that the plaintiff actually has to put in evidence Dr. Silverman had to offer some sort of opinion that had a, a transfer fair ECMO been sought, the more likely than not would not have been accepted. Um, I explained to Dr. Cunningham said that she, he, the plaintiff likely would not have. And I would just like to talk briefly then about Dr. Adler's note. Um, everybody here keeps one on minute. Talking about, yeah, I understand. Um, everybody here keeps on referring to the the 83 pounds that the plaintiff gained. Um, yes, I'll, I'll, you know, I said before, it sounds horrible. And Justice Manzanet, you said it is horrible. I'll accept that. Okay. But that's not on Dr. Adler, even if Dr. Adler's note is the worst note ever. And I don't, I'm not taking the, I'm not agreeing with you that it is, but even if that's the worst note ever, that still the plaintiff's expert doesn't account for the fact that he got, yes, he received, uh, the, the plaintiff received, I believe it was 11 liters of fluid the next day. That's somewhere around 20 pounds. My math is a little off. 
But you, everybody here keeps on talking about the 83 pounds, the 83 pounds. I mean, if I put on 83 pounds, yes, it'd be huge. But that's not that all that weight is not attributable to this note, because what happened is and nobody, you know, the plaintiff doesn't really acknowledge this during trial or any time is that there's this intervening hypotensive episode where she goes to the IA, her blood pressure crashes. They have to give fluid. Nobody's ever explained what other way there is, what other way there is to raise somebody's critically low blood pressure other than administer, they administered pressors, they administered, they gave her fluid. Again, this fluid was given to save her life. It's unfortunate, but I would also point out there's no evidence that this, there was no, it, all, most of this fluid was collect, was third spacing. It wasn't going to her brain. It wasn't, you know, going to her lungs. It was collecting in third space. So while it may look horrible, and I'm, I'm sure it was very disturbing to see her, there's no evidence that it actually resulted in a brain injury. Um, okay. So if there's thank no further you. questions, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Weinberg, you have two minutes. Thank you, Your Honors. I want to start off with Mr. Isaac's point about the resident. And where I think his argument runs afoul is the error in judgment rule recognizes there can be more than one proper course of treatment. The question is not, did doctors disagree with what Dr. Ahmed recommended? The question is, is what Dr. Ahmed recommended a departure from the standard of care? No one's ever said that, not one person. And are, are you are you quibbling with uh, Mr. Isaac's statement that Dr. Stumacher said that Lasix was not indicated? Is that incorrect? He did not say it was not indicated. He said he did not want to give it, which is different. He didn't say it was a departure to recommend it. He said, I love doctor on that, but this is not a choice I want to make in this case. And the choice is mine. And if we're going to say that that means Dr. Ahmed departed, then what that means is you can only have one course of treatment and any other course of treatment is not acceptable. And on top of that, particularly in the fact of this case, we don't even need to talk about what treatment was actually recommended. And in Mr. Isaac's brief, they go as far as to say, the recommendation of Lasix is irrelevant to this case. And if we hold that no one has to say the treatment a doctor recommends is a departure, then what you're saying is that the actual facts of the case are not relevant. Except, except that here, even though it was recommended, it was not given. So but that was not our choice. That's not our, we don't have that authority because it's a closed ICU. All we can do is recommend Lasix. So if another physician doesn't want to do it, and particularly if that physician doesn't call us and say, I'm not doing it, come back tonight. And the only notes talk about early and non-emergent dialysis. And no one says, it's a departure to recommend dialysis on December 10th and do what we actually did, then that another course was chosen by another physician does not automatically mean we departed from the standard of care. And I think this case has gotten focused on what we didn't do instead of what we did. And the only evidence that's in this record is the testimony of Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Brent Silver, who were the only two nephrologists that were called in this case. Dr. Brent Silver was the defendant's expert who says the standard of care is to start with Lasix. And if Dr. Silverman truly believed that for whatever the reason, recommending Lasix first was not appropriate, when put directly to him, the question is, okay, do you disagree with the recommendation of Lasix? Answer, I have no opinion. He could have said, you can't do it in this circumstance because it's a closed ICU and the drugs may not be given to her. He knew those facts. Well, he's, he's supposed to know those facts. Got it. He didn't. All right. Thank, thank you, Your you. Honors. Mr. Buckley, you have one um, minute. Thank you, Your Honor. If the court reaches the issue of damages, I ask the court to give the bar guidance to think that people with amputations accompanying a traumatic in brain injury people with multiple fractures, people with lots of surgeries accompanying the injury are getting 20% of what plaintiff was awarded here. Uh, now what's happening is I think the, the purpose of 5501C, comparable uh, reasonable compensation, is to give us guidance on how can we settle cases, all right? How much are these cases worth? To think that now every plaintiff is gonna start with a brain injury saying it's worth $20 million Please. because Perez is there. All that will happen that's different here about Perez and us 
is at least in Perez, there are towers and towers of insurance. When the insurance runs out for these doctors, a large verdict is going to leave St. Barnabas Hospital, which serves the inner city, bankrupt. Thank you. Okay, downtown New Yorkers versus city of New York. Mr. Hiller, you have four minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. May it please the court. Michael Hiller, Hiller PC, pro bono appellate counsel for petitioners appellants. Today we intend to focus on respondents mootness argument, but of course are available to answer any other questions by the court. The standard for mootness is clear. An appeal is not moot unless the respondents can show that the rights of the appellant would not be affected by the determination of the appeal and the interests of the appellant are not an immediate consequence of the judgment. Well, Here, aren't the aren't the appellants um all haven't they all found other or been found permanent housing at this point now yes they've been transitioned to permanent housing but they they transitioned to permanent housing in reliance upon jobs that they obtained through their affiliation with lucerne and once the lucerne is closed those jobs immediately disappear because the subsidy or grant that provides for those jobs is conditioned upon lucerne remaining open and as the court is well aware, the loss of a job constitutes not just harm, but irreparable harm as a matter of law. We've cited- but Now, though, they, they got, first of all, didn't most of these, uh, most of your clients live um, downtown originally, and then they were brought up to the Lucerne, or didn't they um, mostly live in the Lower East Side area before this Lucerne, op- the Lucerne Hotel was opened? Tragically, uh, mo- my clients had been moved around quite a bit. They were not, all the way downtown. They were frankly all over the place. Uh, And that's what happens. So how do they get jobs that they can keep if they're moving around? And if now in their permanent housing, wouldn't it be a possibility to find jobs where they are more permanently housed at this point? It may very well be that they can at some point in time get other jobs, but I must emphasize to you, we're not talking about the merits right now. We're just talking about standing and do they have a stake in the outcome here? They transition to these apartments based upon the fact that they would be getting income in order to provide for life's requirements, including rent. Losing those jobs would deprive them of the opportunity to continue with that housing. And it's not just the jobs, Your Honor. It's also uh, mental health, chemical dependency reduction programs, and other mental health services, which are offered uh, exclusively. Were, were, were your clients uh, afforded the, the the choice to to move or not move? No, they were told they had to move. What happened was, uh, a counsel in this case, actually, Mr. Mastro, sent a letter to the mayor demanding that the Lucerne be closed and that the inhabitant, the, the residents be forcibly relocated to another community. And that was followed by a series of public announcements for different facilities and uh, until eventually they were told they had to go to the Radisson, at which point the Radisson's community hired a lawyer to try to keep them from coming to the, the downtown area, which sort of dovetails into another point, which is about whether or not, let's assume for the moment that the matter is moot. I don't believe it is because they would lose their jobs and access to these programs. But I do want to talk about uh, an exception to mootness. Uh, As your honors know, um, if if a a matter is moot, it can still be heard as long as the issues are novel. Uh, They're they're susceptible to avoiding the This is Judge Oyne. I don't mean to cut you off. I know where you're headed with this. But this whole situation, that this unfortunate situation that we are encountering, was a direct result of the pandemic unless I'm reading this wrong. I mean, th- this is this is hopefully, God willing, that this is a once in a lifetime situation that we're all gonna have to, have to face. So that when you have three petitioners or, that, or your clients who have now got secure permanent housing, this whole issue of them having standing and challenging their move from uptown to downtown or anywhere else is gone. Because Just, this is the pandemic we're dealing with, and 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 I hope that I'm really hopeful that we don't have to do this again. I mean, have this happen again, so that that's where that's where my I know where you're going with your argument, but this is hopefully once in a generational lifetime situation. I, I have two responses to that. First. Uh, just looking at the situation in India right now, where they thought they had the situation under control, and I'm then not, you know what? I got I got to worry about our own four borders here. No, I can't worry I'm, about I'm just and I'm just saying it's susceptible to recurrence. But here's the larger point, Justice Oyn, because I know where you're going with this. Uh, just last night, I received a notice from Friends of Soho, 
which informed me that the same lawyer who was responsible for forcibly evicting Lucerne residents has been hired by them. They are now go Soho, Friends of Soho is now seeking to prevent a temporary shelter from being moved to that area. No, counsel, and the but problem that's, with that, 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 but that's gonna that's gonna be on a different record. I'm looking at this record right now with respect to your clients and whether or not your clients now still have an interest to litigate this case as interveners. And that's where that's where I'm trying to grapple and say. You know your your arguments say like this is this is going to be going to be repeating itself again, but that could be on a that's a what you just pointed to is another litigation that's going to make its way up here too. Your Honor, in 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 the last forty years, there hasn't been a single case involving a politically motivated forced relocation or forced closure of a temporary facility. And the reason it hasn't come up is that it's not because it hasn't happened because we all know what happens. The reason it didn't happen in the past is because. Quite frankly, you can't. Homeless residents typically don't have access to counsel. We were called in on a Saturday. I came in, filed an order to show cause by Sunday, and was heard by Monday. It's very unlikely, extremely unlikely, that a politically motivated shelter relocation is going to find a lawyer as foolhardy as I was. I've done this pro bono to to work as hard to try to prevent the forced relocation but it's not so much the it's not so much the pandemic justice oing it's the politically motivated forced relocation and i i'm telling you that's going to happen again because it's going to happen in this okay, and, and it that, may you know, but the problem is we have to we have to decide whether under the circumstances here whether this action uh, ultimately was arbitrary and capricious. And as my uh, a colleague is alluding, clearly uh, it made sound sense to put uh, these residents in single rooms rather than shared rooms in well, the midst Your of Honor, a pandemic. I, I understand that point, but Your Honor, it, we're not, the, the, the answer you just gave was not part of the administrative record. There is no administrative record here. The DHS does have procedures for emergency closures. They appear in section 491.23F of Title, 19, Title 18 of NYCRR. They could have followed those procedures, but they didn't. Those procedures require an emergency order by DHS. And in this case, the city acknowledges there was no order by, the, by DHS or by the mayor, number one. They also have to show that there was a finding that there was, that there was a threat that was imminently detrimental to the life and safety of the Absolutely. homeless residents. You know, I got no such findings. Let me, let me stop you right there. That's just as Manzanette said. It was pretty obvious that you had you have individuals, you know, rooming together in 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 facility up in the Lucerne, and to move them down, you know, you're right. There was no emergency order, but it's just common sense that you want to separate them and have them in different in separate rooms. You don't want to have people in the same room except in a pandemic Lucerne, situation. Except that the and Lucerne, you say that that's wrong. The Lucerne, the Lucerne infection rate was 0.8 percent. It was two and a half percent lower than the city's average. Council, we know that. We know that. But we also know that subsequently it skyrocketed in terms of the infection rate that was going on in the city. But not at the Lucerne. The Lucerne you know has what? been consistently okay. low. And again, you're, okay. I, listen, I don't need we, to. We, you have a, you'll have a minute on rebuttal. We're, we're past our time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Z Zalian, you have four minutes. You have to unmute. Yes. Um, thank you, Your Honors. Janet Zalian for the city. Uh, this case is indeed moot, and there's and there's no mootness exception here because we have a very important but very long-standing principle, which is we're talking about a temporary shelter here. Well, can the I ask of, you a question, Ms. Zalian? Uh, it, it relates to something that Mr. Hiller said at the beginning in response to some of my questions. Um, what is the story about, I, I know that these petitioners have been temporarily um, uh, or found moved into temporary or more permanent housing. But what about the issue with jobs and what about the issue of um, um, medical and other kinds of of, of uh, facilities? Treatment services. Um, it, it does, is that part of the thing or do you just find them some things and say goodbye, good luck and uh, don't call us? What What's well, the story here? First of all, um, we explain all the services, including job training and jobs and uh, 
uh, the same service provider would go to the Radisson, but all the, the Radisson would, would provide all these services. So they are not losing those kinds of services that, uh, for people. Oh, I, think just people. Catholic is, I think, I think what, with the respect to the permanent housing that these three individuals are now located, uh, do they still have access to all these services? Well, the, the issue involved here, that two of them are in support of housing. One person appears to be in housing just in an apartment. Um, the issue that they're claiming is basically what happened here is that a third party organization, Goddard Riverside, decided to benefit these folks by providing jobs. And they have an existing jobs program and they uh, put them into this program and also um, apparently some very good community, uh, enterprising community people founded this open hearts and provide a lot of um, uh, services at the Lucerne. And apparently they're allowing the appellants who are no longer um, living at the Lucerne and have exited the shelter system, they are allowing them to participate still in these jobs and services. And that's very commendable in terms of involvement of community people to help their homeless neighbors. Now, the city was not involved in creating these jobs programs and the, and the um, services created by, by neighbors of Lucerne. And there is no claim against the city with regard to any of those matters. Uh, so the type of thing that they're describing is something that third parties did that there is no standing against the city because the city wasn't involved in it. And therefore, the fact that actually not only are these folks, um, uh, not only are these jobs created by third parties, but they have decided to keep these folks involved in those uh, jobs and services, even though they've left the Lucerne, they can go back and do and participate. But that is not a claim against the city. There is no injury against the city because the city didn't provide those particular services. And again, at the Radisson, the city would also, in uh, the city, uh, the shelter provider for the people who are at the shelter. And again, there's no longer any petitioner who is a resident of Lucerne anymore. Those people who are still there are receiving services from a service provider that will then go to the Radisson and provide the same services. Thank you so much. Mr. Mastro, you have four minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Your, Your Honors, I want to answer directly some of the questions that you all asked, okay? Um, Justice Kapnick. These men were at a shelter on East 3rd Street where they got their medical and psychiatric services, their addiction counseling on site. They can't get that at the Lucerne. They had to travel downtown still to this day to get their medical and addiction counseling services on East 3rd Street, which is much closer to the Radisson. You can walk from the Radisson there, all right? So the notion that the Lucerne, and I'm picking up on some of the other comments that were made uh, by some of the you know, uh, other justices here, Justice Owing, um, Justice uh, uh, Kaepernick, uh, there's no question that at the Lucerne and Justice uh, Manzanet, that at the Lucerne, people were being doubled up in a single room occupancy hotel without the same level of services, had to go elsewhere for their medical and addiction counseling, um, and the city made a rational decision that moving them into a new facility with more indoor recreational space, single rooms for every person, and the medical social services on site or in the immediate vicinity was a rational decision. Now, your honors, I have to say a few other things very, very briefly, okay? The law in New York has always been, and you know, state, state laws, the Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance spells it out. Quote, homeless persons do not have the right to choose their own temporary placements. Now, Justice Kapnick, you asked it flat out. Didn't these men voluntarily choose to go elsewhere? Yes, they did. All three of them accepted the city's offer 
to move into city assisted quote unquote permanent housing. Mr. Hiller ignored that question and talked about whether the men wanted to move from one temporary site to another. I'm sorry, temporary shelter is something in a pandemic that is, as Justice Owing so aptly put it, hopefully a once in a generation, a once in a century incident that occurred here. The city dealt with this enormously complex oh, situation. Mr. Master, if I may, opposition to a homeless shelter in a neighborhood is not something that isn't that is unusual just because it was a pandemic. That happens every Perfect. single time that the city tries Perfect. to put a shelter into a neighborhood. Every single time. And the, the neighborhood around the Radisson is organizing to oppose that also. Uh, so it, it's it's a common everyday experience for New York City residents. And you you certainly know that. You've been around. Yes, we, we call it NIMBY, not in my backyard. And, and this is a point I wanted to, to make clear, okay? because the standard for the extraordinary circumstance of an exception to mootness is that it's something that isn't capable of repetition. Um, and it's, it's something that, you know, uh, where um, it's, it will never get addressed and where there's some important, unique you question. Know, isn't it rather curious that of all the people living at the Lucerne, they move out the three petitioners in this case? I mean, come on. Your Honor. No, Your Honor, not at all, because, Your Honor, um, my client and some of my clients are people who lived at the Lucerne um, and wanted to move and wanted to appear to support the city. Mr. Pastors also was moved out. The fact of the matter is they don't have to move when they're offered permanent housing. They make the decision voluntarily to leave because it's a better situation for them. And Mr. Buford, I want to be clear on this. All right. Mr. Buford, um, you know, he's he's tweeted on a regular basis that he's turned down other jobs so he can try and stay in this litigation. He's not at the Lucerne. Those are not city jobs, but let me put it to you this way. The city and Project Renewal, which is the service provider, they both swore, and it was part of the record below, and the lower court correctly found that, um, in fact, um, there would be at least the same level of services and a jobs program provided by the city and the service provider to downtown. Your best argument, your best oh, argument yeah. is that on an Article 78, the appellants have an extremely high hill to climb, and you don't. Correct. That's, that's Correct, the strongest argument that, to me that you can make. That when, we inter when we intercede to change uh, what the administration has done in an Article 78, guess what happens? Right, and, and especially in a situation like this, Your Honor, where the city needs to have that discretion. I used to be okay. there. Mr. Right? Master, thank you, know, you so much, but you are two minutes over time. Okay, I'm sorry, thank Your Honor. you. We've got your wrong. argument. Mr. Hiller, it. you have thank one you. minute. Thank you. Uh, speaking to Justice Mazzarelli's point, you should know that when the first week of my representation of the petitioners, all three were approached by the city. They have been trying to moot this case from the beginning to make the arguments you just heard. I do very much want to address something that Justin o Justice Oing said that's been uh, picked up by the other justices. I ask you to turn to page 14 of our brief because the story you've gotten about COVID, it's, it's just not the case. I have the mayor's announcement of his reasoning for this. It had nothing to do with COVID. In fact, it was the opposite of what's being said today. He said, quote, I went to the Upper West Side community because I had heard of such concern from the community. He goes on to say, I know the Upper West Side really well. This is something, what I saw was just not acceptable to me. And it proved to me that there was a problem that wasn't being addressed. And at the end, and this is the critical part, especially for you, Justice Oing, but much more importantly, the whole situation has begged the question, wasn't it time to reverse what was a temporary strategy at the height of the coronavirus? And this all has made clear to me the answer is yes. They were going to move the Lucerne residents to the Harmonia, a smaller facility where everyone was going to be doubled up. I am telling you, the problem we have here is we have no administrative record because the city didn't want one. Had they followed the rules, then there would be in a different situation. But Justice Mazzarelli, your point about arbitrary and capricious, the law is clear that if the respondents did not comply with lawful procedure, they lose. I realize it's a, it's a tough mountain to climb, but if they violate procedure, I'm in an elevator going up. 
because when they violate a lawful procedure, that is the strongest argument I have. And again, 491.23 sub F requires an order, I mean, an emergency order by DHS. There's no emergency order here because there's no administrative record here. And under 7804 of the CPLR, there's no exception to an administrative law, administrative record requirement. They must provide it and they have Mr. it. Miller, and I have just one comment. It would have been easier if your clients turned down those permanent housing and then you'd have standing and would be able to litigate this. Your Honor, what I would say to you is this. I right. would never I mean, advise that, my clients. That's an, accurate, that's an accurate statement. If your clients, if your three clients had turned down, as Mr. Mastro said, they had the opportunity. They didn't have to accept it. If they had turned down those offers, we wouldn't be having this argument. You'd have your, you'd have the full Article 78 proceeding go full speed ahead. We uh, have the, answer to, the answer to that question is for those men who have spent a lifetime on the street, homeless, the prospect of giving up your own apartment with a job and access to mental health services, I could never advise them to do that for the purposes of a case. It's These guys have gone through the ringer. Uh, Mr. Mastro said they were on the Lower East Side. They no, were don't, everywhere. Don't take my comments as being, uns I'm totally sympathetic with that. I'm, I'm just saying that this whole dispute that we're dealing with now, the mootness and everything, it's just, it's a very complicated, complex situation, but okay. Your Honor, just 15 more seconds and I promise I will wrap up. You have so 10 seconds, that's it. I have to get on to the last no, case. Of course, I know you have a big case coming up. I just wanna say again, that right now, these men have jobs. Those jobs help subsidizing the lives that they have after living a lifetime on the street. The reason I took this case pro bono was because of my concern that these men weren't being taken care of and that they were being subjected to politically motivated efforts to have them move from this, this the Upper West Side. And as a consequence, it could happen again, which I believe it was. So I urge the court, give us a hearing on the merits. If you end up ruling against us, you rule us against us, but please give these men the opportunity to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And now we have the last case of the day, Wells Fargo versus U.S. Bank et al. Okay, gentlemen, have we, and, and, and ladies, I believe we have at least two, two women attorneys on this panel. Okay, uh, have the appellants decided, one, the order of who, who will argue first? Should I continue in the in the order that I that I uh, listed when I call yes. the case? Yes, David Sheeran, uh, uh, appearing pro hack DJ uh, with Gibbs and Bruns in Texas. Uh, first of all, thank you for the honor of appearing before the court. Uh, I'm pleased to say that after this afternoon's marathon session, we thought we'd resolve this issue of rebuttal time by agreeing that no one would get rebuttal time. Um, so one, we are still going to resolve the case? Cut through this. <laughs> yeah, that's really had enough time. That would have been even more wonderful, but okay. <laughs> well, we thought we had resolved the case when we settled it, but here we are. Yes, here we uh, are. So, Mr. Sh Sheeran, I will hear you first, and you have seven minutes. May it please the court. Um, obviously, uh, Your Honors, this is uh, a complex dispute involving a lot of money. Um, there were four and a half billion dollars in the underlying settlement that our clients, who are 16 well-known institutional investors, uh, achieved uh, back in 2013. About 1.3 billion of those settlement funds remains in escrow, pending the outcome of this uh, dispute over how the funds will be distributed. At the end of 2017, the trustees, who you're not going to hear from today, uh, of the hundreds of trusts at issue in that settlement, filed an Article 77 proceeding to resolve six uh, key issues on, on how the funds would be distributed. Uh, any one of those six with this amount of money would have been a, a mega case. Uh, you have six mega cases in this Article 77. So the issues are complex. Um, after two and a half years, Justice Friedman issued a decision which we believe correctly resolved five of those six disputes um, as to one issue that you'll hear about whether certain senior certificates are eligible uh, for uh, certificate write-ups we believed uh, the trial court respectfully overlooked uh, some contract language and, and a 10-year course of performance 
But before even getting to the merits, I want to address uh, a threshold issue that uh, is of vital importance to our clients, and that is the subject of the joint motion uh, that the parties filed without opposition, um, asking this court to adopt a briefing stipulation that the parties had reached. Uh, the case is complex because investors uh, appeared and, and some investors won on some of the six issues, lost on other of the six issues. And so in this appeal, you have respondents who are adverse to each other. Uh, in the ordinary course of the appeal, that would have meant that you would have multiple parallel cross appeals with two briefs per party and four rounds of briefing. Um, the parties, uh, thankfully, got together, decided that that would have been a terrible way to present these issues to this court. We reached a stipulation that cut the rounds of briefing from four down to three, um, and the, that stipulation was accepted by the clerk's office. There's a somewhat painful history, but the bottom line is the parties filed their briefs on the basis of, of that stipulation. Um, after the second of the three round agreed schedule, uh, five of the briefs were rejected uh, by the clerk's office. And these are core briefs. These are, these are briefs, for example, where our clients have put in all of their merits arguments defending the trial court's decision on five of those six issues. Um, and so that's a threshold issue that, that we think needs to be resolved out of the gate. Um, I have the docket entries of the five briefs that were rejected. Um, you know, if you sit down with the opening and response and reply briefs, these five briefs were in the second round. Uh, their docket entries 67. Council, that I, I really suggest you get to the substance of your argument because you you have already wasted three minutes and haven't told me anything. Uh, understood, understood. <laughs> we just uh, wanted to, for the record, uh, 67, 68, 70, 71, and 76. They're not on the public docket, but we understand that the panel has access to them. I want to talk about two merits issues. Uh, the first is the issue of over collateralization. Uh, over collateralization in these residential mortgage backed trusts meant that when these trusts were created 15 years ago, the balances of the mortgages exceeded the balances of the certificates that were marketed to investors. That was a mechanism in these deals that was supposed to, like so many other features of the deals, make these safe investments. Those senior certificates, uh, those AAA rated certificates were, were supposed to be safe because a number of mortgages could default, uh, people could go through foreclosures, and losses wouldn't even hit the investors. Uh, we know that uh, that didn't work, that these were toxic securities. Uh, the settlement trusts uh, involved in this global settlement suffered $60 billion of losses. Uh, those losses were borne by our clients who hold about a third of, of the bonds and by thousands of others. What that meant was sitting here in 2021, that initial level of over collateralization in the deals, uh, it was depleted. Uh, over collateralization failed and losses uh, over time reduced the balances of the certificates. Now we get to a point where we have a global settlement that while substantial at four and a half billion dollars, will not make these trusts whole um, for their $60 billion in losses. In the trial court, two parties took the position that the payment of the settlement money would somehow resurrect the over collateralization that was supposed to protect these certificates. Justice Friedman rejected that argument on the contract and she backed up her interpretation of the contract language with a common sense explanation that these trusts are not over collateralized. They weren't over collateralized before the settlement and they won't be over collateralized after the settlement. And she interpreted a term of the PSAs, which are the contracts that govern the trusts, um, that defines the level of over collateralization in a way that clearly is not impacted by the settlement payment. And so that is a vital issue 
uh, here to our clients and other investors because uh, if you were to accept the fiction that over collateralization was created by the settlement payment, what you could see is that substantial portions of the settlement money would flow down not to the senior certificates, but to far more junior certificates who were only ever supposed to receive over collateralization if the trust were performing well. And we know that they were not. Um, okay. So I'll you, pause you there. You are now out of time. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank Mr. you for your time. Mr. Reed for American General Life, you have six minutes. If you are speaking, we cannot hear you. Thank you, uh, Your Honor. Um, I'm here representing the AIG parties. I'm going to address that portion of the appeal that seeks reversal of the IAS courts holding that the governing agreements for the so-called Exhibit E trusts prohibit write-ups for senior certificates. And more specifically, I'm going to discuss how the IAS court failed in failing to recognize that the governing documents for the Exhibit E trusts unambiguously permit senior certificate write-ups. I'd like to start by highlighting a critical concession made by Nova Ventures. Now, Nova, your honors may recall, is the only one of the myriad parties in this Article 77 proceeding taking the position that the Exhibit E trusts do not permit senior certificate write-ups. Among the reasons that can't be right is that it would result in an impermissible mismatch between a trust's assets and its liabilities in the Some, event- Hold on a minute. Somebody is, hold on a minute. Someone is, um, turning pages and I'm not able to hear you while that's happening. So either someone has to turn off their mic so that it doesn't interfere with the argument. Continue, I'm sorry. Sure, Your Honor. Um, so among the reasons that Nover's position, which was adopted by the IAS court, can't be right, is that it would result in an impermissible mismatch between a trust's assets and liabilities in the event a trust received a subsequent recovery that exceeded the amount of the losses allocated to the subordinate certificates. In that situation, if the senior certificates can't be written up in an amount equal to the excess, the trust ends up having an asset without a corresponding liability, and that can't be. Everybody recognizes that. Now, Nova's initial response on this point is, well, that hasn't happened in any of the Exhibit E trusts. But that's irrelevant, of course, because there would have been no way to know that when the trust's governing agreements were drafted, and Nova's aware of that. And Nova is also aware that you can't have a mismatch between a trust assets and liabilities. So buried in a footnote in its brief on page 36, Nova concedes that if there was a situation where a subsequent recovery exceeded the losses allocated to the subordinated certificates, quote, the petitioners should write up the senior certificates. And that's the critical concession because the only way the petitioners could write up the senior certificates in that circumstance is if the trust's governing documents allow them to. So confronted with the fact that its position could lead to an absurd result, Nova concedes that senior certificate write-ups are in fact permissible, contrary to the position it took before the IAS court and that the IAS court adopted. And by the way, as Mr. Gradman was going to discuss in detail on behalf of the Ellington and DW parties, we also know that these senior write-ups are permissible because before they filed this petition, the petitioners over the past 10 years did write up the senior certificates in these trusts when subsequent recoveries were received. <coughs> is, is that the case for all, all of the relevant parties? Did, did all of the parties have the ability to write up senior certificates? Or was that to, dependent on the, the governing documents of each fund? Your Honor, we're, what the history shows is that the petitioners who are responsible for construing the governing documents construed them to allow them to write up the senior certificates. The evidence in the record shows that that happened on a regular basis over the years before the petition was filed. Okay. All right. So there's an additional absurd result that flows from Nover's position that senior write-ups are prohibited, and that is that it upends the whole senior subordinate certificate structure that's fundamental to these trusts, and in fact, all of the trusts that are subject to the petition. As we set out in our opening brief, the defining feature of the senior subordinate structure is that the subordinate certificates act as loss protection for the seniors by absorbing losses to the fullest extent they can before any losses are allocated to the seniors. And the key provisions of the prosups discussing that structure describe this mechanism, and even Nover concedes in its brief 
that the governing agreements, quote, provide that the junior classes of certificates absorb losses first. But that's not what happens if senior certificates can't be written up. In that world, when a loss is allocated to the senior certificate, the loss can never be reversed because it can't be written up, even if the trust receives a recovery to offset the loss. That recovery in Nover's world can only be used to reverse losses suffered by the subordinate certificates, which would mean that the senior certificates are effectively functioning as loss protection for the junior certificates. It would reverse the roles, you're saying. Exactly. The whole point of the subordinated certificates is that they get paid more because they take losses first. And what Nover's pr pr proposing, what the, dis the, the IAS court adopted, reverses that, which is fundamental to the whole structure. And that's why we think the Lipper case that we cited is relevant, because it says at 171, I'm sorry, 183rd, 171, that contracts shouldn't be interpreted to produce a result that is absurd, commercially unreasonable, or contrary to the reasonable expectations of the party. So let me lastly turn to the language of the contract and explain why it need not be interpreted to bring about those absurd results. Okay, you have one minute to do that. Go ahead. The IAS court based its ruling that, that, that senior certificates can't be written up on a provision of the PSAs that expressly authorizes write-ups for subordinate certificates, but doesn't mention write-ups for senior certificates. The provision doesn't prohibit write-ups for seniors, but because it doesn't explicitly authorize them, the IAS court found that they are not allowed. But what the IAS court failed to do was look at the remainder of the agreement, and specifically the definition of realized losses. As we describe in our brief, that definition specifies that, quote, any certificate, unquote, is eligible for realized loss reversals. And that's key because the only way you can reverse a loss allocated to a certificate is to write up that certificate. Write it up. Losses are allocated to certificates by writing down their principal balances, and they're reversed by writing up their principal balances. So when you make senior certificates eligible for loss reversals, that necessarily means you make them eligible for write-ups. And this is thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Rose, you have five minutes. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Danielle Rose from Cobra and Kim on behalf of U.S. Bank as indenture trustee for the HBK NIMS Trust, and uh, we're referred to as the HBK parties. Uh, I think you'll be grateful to know I'm addressing one issue today, <laughs> and it's a very simple issue of con contractual interpretation. Uh, this, this, this appeal is a de novo review. And what the other litigants are asking this court to do is extraordinary. They're asking that this court interpret a provision contrary to all the basic canons of New York law that says that, that trustees cannot distribute funds to certain certificates to mean the exact opposite, that it authorizes those funds to be distributed. And the retired class provision, and I'll go through that in a moment, should be interpreted to mean what it says. So what is the retired class provision that we're talking about? Uh, in, the, in each of these trusts, in the HBK trusts, there's a waterfall. And this is the waterfall is at the core of this whole case. But the waterfall directs how funds are distributed each month, and it has rules for the priority of those payments and for the, which certificates are eligible for those payments. And so the issue here relates to eligibility. And each month, funds come into the trust, and, they're, and when the funds come in, cert certificates either receive principal or they don't receive principal, in which case at realized losses are allocated to those certificates. And eventually that principal balance goes down to zero. Now in these trusts, there's a provision that says in no uncertain terms for any distribution date after those class A and class M certificates go to zero, there they are, they will be retired and they are will no longer be entitled to any distributions. It's it's permanent, it occurs for any distribution date after those certificate principal balances reach at zero. And it does not matter how, why, or when those certificates reach zero, they are retired and will no does, longer does be Does the retired. language of those provisions uh, say that uh, at the moment that an account reaches zero, uh, that, that that fact automatically done then uh, uh, means that it is retired for all purposes permanently? 
Is there anything in the language that I can look to that that specifically answers that question, not by implication, but by by direct statement? I think I think the answer is yes, because it says on any distribution date after it hits zero, it will no longer be entitled to distributions. And the way the lower court and the lower court just read this out of the contract, it didn't even engage with this provision. Instead, it flipped the page of the contract and instead of looking at 504A, it looked at 504B and said, oh, well, if the trust gets funds in for subsequent recoveries because loans are liquidated and more money comes in, well, then we can increase these certificate principal balances. They're no longer zero. Problem solved. But it does not solve the problem because it says on any distribution date after it hits zero, it will no longer be entitled to, to, to distributions. As a threshold matter, the, the certificates were retired, so they're not even eligible to be written up. And then secondly, they're not allowed to get distributions. Is, and is not, there any language that speaks to that specifically, that once uh, uh, an account is deemed retired, it can no longer be written up if there are subsequent uh uh right. monies recover so is there any language five, yeah. to that effect there is no explicit language other than that that it says that it has to be retired and then it no longer is entitled and so but the way that this was was interpreted by the court it just read this entire provision out of the contract because in the ordinary course if you didn't have this retired class provision like for example in the hundreds of other trusts in this case what would happen is the balance would go down to zero money would come in for subsequent recoveries and then it could bounce up and you know be increased and then paid and then paid but here this provision is given no meaning by anyone but and is all it possible Judge, Judge Mazzarelli has a question isn't it possible to really read this provision either way I mean is this really such a clear provision or isn't there some ambiguity to this provision provision as to what happens. We think it's clear in our favor, but as a but as a practical matter, if it's not, it's it can clearly be read our way because it says it's no longer entitled to it. But there's nothing in this record that permits it to be read the other way. So if the Except court were to find no language about what happens in the event that additional monies are recovered. It says well, though, that that account never existed, but it did exist. And had it not been zero uh, prior to the recovery, they would have been entitled, right? No, I don't think that's correct. Because I think that because what the contract says is on any distribution date, it will no longer be entitled to distributions. And you have you didn't to understand my question. Oh, okay. I'm I saying so th these these accounts that were, were quote unquote zero at zero, you're saying based on the provision you have quoted to us that uh, that's it, it's all over. Once it reaches zero, any date after that, uh, you can't get a distribution. Uh, but but you also acknowledge that there is no language that, that, that tells us uh, what happens in the event of a subsequent recovery that would have been uh, part of that pool, right? So I so the, the the I think the issue that you're focused on is the interplay between 504A and 504B. And is there any and I thought the question was like, is there anything that tells us how do you explicit on the face of this, how do you how do you deal with this tension between 504B and 504A? We don't think there's a tension because we think it says on any distribution date thereafter, you're no longer entitled to distributions and it's retired. But to the extent, as Justice Mazzarelli was saying, well, hey, isn't there isn't there tension between this? What we're saying is that tension cannot be resolved on this record based on the face of this contract because the contract says the exact opposite. And so the only thing in the record on this issue is the contract and the lit other litigants, and there's mountains of paper about this, but it boils down to they're asking you to interpret a provision that says you cannot do something to mean that you can do something. And this is a contract negotiated among sophisticated parties represented by counsel, and it has bright line, clear, unambiguous rules. Those should Thank be interpreted you. on their face. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Hockman for Tilden Park, you have seven minutes. 
Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, John Hockman with Schindler Cohen and Hockman for Tilden Park. Uh, Your Honor, the central issue on Tilden Park's appeal is whether the settlement agreement's uniform write-up provision should be enforced as it is written. The court below said no. And what this issue goes to, again, is whether or not the senior certificates can be written up, but we arrive at the place that Mr. Reed was describing by an entirely different route based on the reading of the settlement agreement and the proposition that the settlement agreement takes priority over conflicting provisions of the PSAs. The, the court below held that enforcing the write-up provision of the- I, I wonder why, why is it the posi your position that the settlement agreement takes precedence over the contractual agreement and the contracts were there first. Why should you be able to enter into a settlement agreement that changes the arrangements that you had in, in the governing uh, agreements like the PSAs and the other contractual relationships you had before between you? So, uh, Your Honor, under the PSAs, the trustees have the right, uncontroversially, to enter into settlement agreements. And those settlement agreements can be blessed as this one was by the lower court. This agreement was made on elaborate notice and everyone who had an interest in this was able to see what the settlement agreement said, what changes, if any, were being made, had the opportunity to object to it if they so desired. And having not done so, it was then uh, given the imprimatur of the court. So in effect, and this is part but, but of what But wait was, a minute. The, yeah. There are aspects and language in this settlement agreement that 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 speak to and refer to the PSA uh, in certain instances. So I don't think that this settlement, uh, this settlement agreement wiped away all of the terms of the underlying contracts uh, uh, in this in this litigation, I I, and and there's no language in the settlement agreement that says that. Uh, well, I I agree with everything right up to that last moment because I think well, that what the settlement agreement. Tell me where in the where in the I, settlement agreement yes, it says that the terms of the settlement agreement supersede all of the contracts. Well, what it 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 doesn't say that in those words. What it does is it tells you when the settlement agreement wants you to defer to the to the PSAs, it harnesses them for certain reasons. And when it does that, it says so explicitly in, in the distribution provision of 306A, it says in these words, use the distribution provisions of the governing agreements. Other places it says, uh, it says, in accordance with or pursuant to or as given in. So it tells you exactly when it wants you to use those agreements. And it also tells you when there's a gap that might occur in those agreements and it's filling that gap. And it does that in 3.06a as well, where it refers to the fact that there was um, uh, no, in certain PSAs, there might be no concept of a subsequent recovery. So there may be a gap and it tells you how to fill that gap. But there's a third thing that it does, and this goes directly to your question, Your Honor. Sometimes it just tells you what to do and it doesn't make any reference to deferring to the PSAs or to any gaps to fill. It just says, as 306B does, here's how we want you to write up these certificates in the reverse order of losses for each, cert each class of certificates. And when it gives a uniform, unequivocal rule like that, we think it should be read as it's written. And how do we know that it's supposed so to? So are, are, are you saying that everybody on this screen agreed to the settlement agreement, but you can't agree on how to interpret the settlement agreement vis-a-vis -vis all the different governing agreements and that you have some differences in the interpretation? Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying that everybody on the screen had an opportunity to object to the settlement agreement. The settlement agreement says what it says and what it says is clear. And all we're asking is that it be enforced 
by its terms. Yeah, and but so obviously, what, I mean, it, you say it's clear, but there's an awful lot of dispute about it, what it means. So I'm not so sure it's so clear. You know, right. uh, I had one of these way back when, and boy, I know there's a lot of issues. I had one of the very first ones. So one of the things that I would point out to your honor in that connection is there are certain places where it's just crystal clear that the settlement agreement was supposed to override the terms of the PSAs because it says so. One is in um, uh, 306A. Excuse me, but is, is, is it then that we should presume that if it doesn't specifically say it overrides the governing agreements in that particular point, then we have to say the settlement agreement controls? I think I think that unless it defers to the to the governing agreements, when it just says flat out, here's what you should do, that's what you should do. And and all I was going to point out is there are a couple very distinct instances where it says, here's what would happen under the PSAs. Don't do that. Do what we're telling you so, to do. So in all other respects, then the govern then the governing agreements have to be the ones that control. Is that is that what you're saying? I think what I'm saying is that there are really three situations. There are the ones where the settlement agreement just flat out tells you what to do. There are the ones where it says defer the to the PSAs. We want to harness the PSAs to do certain things like tell you how to do distributions. And then there are the ones that say if there's a gap in the PSAs, here's how to fill the gap. So I think it's it's a consistent framework, the structure of this agreement makes tons of sense. And when there's a simple, flat out, unequivocal instruction, here's how to do what you're supposed to do, that should be honored because otherwise there would have been no there would have been no reason to say, here's when you should defer to the to the PSAs. If the PSAs always governed, why would there be four different places in this agreement that says do it pursuant to the PSAs, do it according to the PSAs, do it, you know, in connection with the PSAs? There's no, there wouldn't be any reason for that. And so uh, I guess what I'd like to say is this goes very much to the lower court's argument about the no amendments clause. The reason that we know that no amendments can't mean you have you, one, you have less than a minute. So okay. please wrap it I'm up. Good. I, I will do. The the reason we know that the no amendments clause can't mean you can't vary the PSAs is because of the instances where it does. And what it says is not that the PSAs can't supersede or override. I'm sorry, that the settlement agreement can't supersede or override the PSAs. What it says is this is a settlement of disputed claims. Therefore, it shouldn't be deemed or argued to be an amendment. An amendment is a technical term under the PSAs, which would have required a whole different procedure and shareholder votes and all of that. So it was important that they say that. But that's the actual meaning of the no right. amendment. Thank clause. you. You're out of time, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Ricardo, for AMBAC, you have five minutes. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. AMBAC insured certificates in three of the trusted issue here. I want to talk about two issues. Uh, first, language that's in two of the 2006 trusts, specifically addressing subsequent recoveries. And then briefly at the end, I'd like to speak about why the write-up first method properly applies in certain trusts. Starting with the first issue, the decision failed to give effect to language that's in two of the 2006 trusts, specifically addressing subsequent recoveries. And that language says, that when AMBAC is owed money for paying claims, section 6.02 says that after the servicer deposits the subsequent recoveries in the custodial account, they will be used first to pay what AMBAC is owed. And the import of that is these provisions 6.02B and 6.02C, which says subsequent recoveries will first be allocated, will, or will be allocated first to the certificate insurer, which is AMBAC, is that these provisions single out subsequent recoveries and say distribute them differently from other types of funds whenever AMBAC is owed reimbursement amounts. And AMBAC is owed over $100 million in reimbursement amounts. Now, 
The decision on appeal was incorrect about these provisions for several reasons. To start, it failed to treat subsequent recoveries differently from other funds. Instead, it lumped them together with principal funds and just treated them like all the other funds. Second, it failed to pay any subsequent recoveries first to AMBAC, despite that command in 6.02b and 6.02c. Instead, it said pay them pro rata to the, to the class A holders and to AMBAC at the same time. And third, the decision rendered this language in 6.02 superfluous because it provided, the decision below provided the same result that would have occurred if we just removed that language from the PSA entirely. The decision construed 6.02 to mean that AMBAC is paid in the place of the insured class A2 certificates under 6.01. But AMBAC already had that same right in the earlier 2005 trust. And that 2005 trust lacks the special language I talked about in 6.02. Additionally, AMBAC has the right to stand in the shoes and get paid at the same time in the place of the insured holders by virtue of an entirely different provision in the PSA for uh, the 2006 trust, uh, section 4.07D, which provides AMBAC a right of subrogation. So the question we're left with is, why would the parties go to the trouble of adding section 6.0, these provisions in 6.02 to the 2006 trusts, which address subsequent recoveries specifically, just to accomplish what the 2005 trust already provided and to accomplish what a different provision in the PSA for the 2006 trusts provided. It, it simply makes no sense to give no effect uh, to this language, which is directly on point. Now, um, in the briefing, there was some question about, well, why is it that AMBAC gets to get these recoveries first from, from the custodial account? And, and we submit that's the only way that that, that that can happen, because if the subsequent recoveries are not set aside for payment first, before they become part of principal funds, and if you don't set them aside first and just treat them uh, like any other principal funds, then basically it'll give no effect at all to this language that's in 6.02 that says treat subsequent recoveries differently when AMBAC is owed money. And, and that's where the decision below fall, uh, fell short. I do want to speak uh, very briefly you have about. One minute. Uh, yes, I understand that. I want to speak very briefly about uh, the write up first provision. Uh, this is an area where we say the decision got it right. Uh, I think I can shortcut this very simply. The order of operations, whether it's write up or pay first, comes down to a very simple question. Does the calculation of certificate principal balance add subsequent recoveries from the current month or just the subsequent recoveries from the prior months? If it includes subsequent recoveries from the current month, that means it's a write up first method. But if it's limited to prior months, then it's a pay first method. The trusted issue here plainly includes subsequent recoveries from the current month, and that provides the answer to the question on order of operations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, respondents, DW, uh, DW Partners, Mr. Gradman, you have six minutes. Thank you. May it please the court, Isaac Radman on behalf of DW and Ellington. <clears throat> and I'll be addressing the Exhibit E issue today, which is whether senior certificates can be written up. Uh, and with respect to Exhibit E, we ask the court to find that senior certificates may be written up, which preserves the status quo. As the trustees have been writing up senior certificates in these Exhibit E trusts for the better part of 15 years. Now, as has been acknowledged today, Justice Friedman got many things right in this complex proceeding, but she erred on Exhibit E for three reasons. First, as my colleague, Mr. Reed stated, she focused on one provision, what we've called the 6.02H provision, and read that as a prohibition on senior write-ups, even though it's completely silent. Second, she failed to recognize that other provisions in the governing agreements permit and in fact require senior write-ups. Mr. Reed touched on the definition of realized loss, which expressly discusses reduction of realized loss with respect to any class. 
which is the same thing as a write-up. But there are other provisions of the pro-stops, which this court has held must be read in conjunction with the PSAs because there were contracts entered into at the same time on the same subject matter. And there's one in particular that I'd like to draw the court's attention to, and that's in the record at 10412. That's the SAMEO 6AR5 prospectus supplement. And what it says, and I quote, the certificate principal balance of each class of certificates that has been reduced by the allocation of a realized loss to such certificate will be increased in order of seniority by the amount of such subsequent recovery. It expressly told investors who were getting uh, information about what they were investing in that all certificates that had been written down would be entitled to be written up when subsequent recoveries came in. That's critical. There are other prospective supplements that said similar things. At the record at 10414, the SAMI 07 AR4 ProSup. These types of uh, provisions would render Justice Freeman's interpretation of 6.02H in conflict. And when the court had ruled in that manner that, that there was actually an exclusion on senior write-ups, it was incumbent upon her to recognize that there were conflicting provisions, such as the ones we've just touched on, and consider extrinsic evidence. Uh, the Rachel Bridge Court decision at 819 NYS 2nd 212 says the dispute may not be resolved without the aid of extrinsic evidence when there is an ambiguity in the contract. And here we have unambiguous uh, course of performance evidence, which many courts, the federal insurance case predominantly, have held is the best example, uh, is the best evidence of the party's uh, understanding of that agreement. And so at minimum, while we don't think these agreements are, are ambiguous, we think they consistently permit write-up of senior certificates, at minimum, the interpretation of, of 6.02H by Justice Friedman would render them uh, ambiguous and required her to consider what was the only evidence presented of course of performance or any extrinsic evidence in this case, which was that the trustees have been consistently writing up senior certificates. And that's in the record 10454 and 10456 to 10462. These are monthly remittance reports that the trustees, the petitioners in this case, distribute and make available to investors every month. And all investors had access to these reports. It was well known that the trustee was writing up certificates. And DW and Ellington presented this information in their opening brief uh, in, in the underlying proceeding. No party, including Nover, contested that evidence. No party presented any other evidence of the course of performance that conflicted with this. And Justice Friedman herself, in her order approving the settlement in the first place, recognized that the trustees had the greatest expertise in applying the waterfall provisions of the trust. And that's at the record at 5459. So she held that the trustees did not have to obtain an expert opinion about how to interpret these contract provisions because they were the subject matter experts. So we submit it's clear error to simply ignore, as Justice Friedman did, the evidence in the record that for the better part of 15 years, senior certificates have been getting written up as all the parties expected them to. And the settlement agreement itself was drafted with a consistent approach. The settlement agreement uh, specifically says all, all uh, certificates to suffer losses should be written up in the reverse order in which those losses were suffered. So those parties, which included the trustees, also anticipated that all certificates eligible for write downs would also be eligible for write ups. This isn't a priority question, your honors. This is a question uh, that goes beyond that because the reading of, of this Exhibit E provision would make it impossible for the seniors to ever receive write-ups again. Not just that they receive them late, they would never, once they suffered a loss, be entitled to have that loss reversed, no matter how much uh, money the trust recovered. So it's simply incredible to find that these contracts unambiguously uh, prevent senior certificates from being written up. And I would just point, my final point would be to point yes, the court- you are 20 seconds shy of running out of time. Great. Uh, there's a commercial division case on very similar facts, matter of Bank of New York Mellon uh, as trustee for 278 trusts. That's at 68 miscellaneous third, 1206A. 
Similar to this case, it involved one investor arguing that the trustee should change its distribution practices after 10 years, where no certificate holder had objected, and where the other certificate holders appearing all agreed the status quo was the right methodology. And the Supreme Thank Court you. held the party's decade-long course of we performance the was the best evidence. Mr. Sturm, you have six minutes from GMO Opportunistic. Thank you, Your Honor. Joshua Sturm from Davis Polk and Wardell on behalf of the GMO funds. Uh, you'll be pleased to know I'm also addressing just one of the six merits questions before Your Honors. Um, that is the one raised by Tilden Parks Council, and that's the question that applies to a subset of the trusts. That's the trusts with write-up instructions that provide that certain senior classes of certificates were supposed to be written up before junior classes of certificates. And the question that Your Honors asked is, did the settlement agreement supersede and change those priorities? We argue it did not. We think Justice Friedman's opinion in our briefs on appeal explained in exhaustive detail why Section 7.05 of the settlement agreement says what it means and means what it says. And when it says that it is not intended to and shall not be argued or deemed to constitute an amendment of any term of a governing agreement, it meant um, that if you have a governing agreement and you had it yesterday and that governing agreement has a term that says you are senior in write-ups to someone else, then after the settlement agreement, you are still senior in write-ups to someone else. Now, I want to focus a little bit differently because I think we spend a lot of time on the language on why Tilden Park's alternative interpretation is actually unprecedented from a purely legal standpoint and also implausible from an interpretation standpoint. And I think uh, some of your honors asked the questions that I was thinking about. Uh, Judge Kapnick asked, why would the settlement agreement change contractual relationships? And that's that's a legal precedent question. It's not easy to just say, well, I waive the Article 77 wand and whatever the trustee did becomes a new law. There is ample precedent, and we do not argue with Tilden Park, that a trustee can enter a settlement with a third party. If the trust has a claim against a third party, there's a settlement and the trust receives proceeds. That's not controversial. We can take a step further along with something that it looks like they tried to do in this settlement agreement. Well, what if I say I'm entering a settlement with a third party and that third party, in this case, JP Morgan, also might be one of my trust beneficiaries? Well, that's a provision that council has spent a lot of time on in 3.06a. And here the trustee said, well, it wouldn't make sense to make JP Morgan pay money to certain certificate holders if JP Morgan holds a lot of those certificates. So they created a mechanism. It's not a straight, Provision A in this agreement says go left, and we're now saying go right. They devised a situation where those payments from JP Morgan get held in a certain account and delayed, and as a result, it probably is the case that it will change the distributions. We're not arguing about it today. That's going a step further on precedent, and nobody's disputing that. What Tilden Park is asking to do is go another step further out on the branch. They're saying, well, there was a settlement between a trustee and a third party. That has nothing to do with the write-up of these senior and junior certificates. But we found a provision in that settlement where when read our way means that the trustees went ahead and made the senior certificates parry with the juniors. Why? We don't know. There's no indication. We're not even suggesting one. We're just saying that we think that's what happened. And we submit that Tilden Park hasn't presented any precedent for an Article 77 doing that. And that really turns to the other question uh, I think a couple of the justices were getting at, particularly Justice Kavanaugh. Well, is it clear, right? So one thing is clear. Tillman Park wasn't in the room negotiating that agreement, and the GMO funds weren't in the room negotiating that agreement. They were presented in an Article 77 saying, here's a settlement agreement. And you heard Tillman Park Council say, well, it's really clear. They should have known that if they read it exactly the way I read it, clearly their rights were taken away from them. Well, the institutional investors who negotiated that agreement didn't read it that way. Other sophisticated funds didn't read it that way. And Justice Friedman didn't read it that way. A sophisticated commercial judge who read hundreds of pages probably of briefing and held arguments. So to say that somehow Article 77 took these contractual rights of certificate holders and changed them vis-a-vis -vis one another as part of the settlement up top is implausible. And I'm not saying that it's implausible and therefore you have to read the agreement against its words. Justice Friedman didn't rely on this. She read the agreement. 705 says what it says. 306, the provision that Tilden Park focuses on, has a real purpose. It's a gap filler. It's not a theoretical gap filler. There's at least 10 trusts that didn't have a provision. So it fills in a provision for those trusts. Are the words in there that says this only applies to those trusts? 
I concede they're not. I think 705 is those words. 705 is what says that you don't just willy-nilly change interest certificate holder terms. Now, I will add one last thing about 306A because Tilden Press Council created a very elaborate and self-serving construct of exactly how and when he thinks the settlement agreement meant to change terms. The one he is focused on the most and the only one that we actually think does change interest certificate holder terms is the JP Morgan one I referred to earlier. When the settlement agreement does that, it says that where the governing agreements provide that a distribution would be payable to a class of RAM makers or holders, it calls, here's a sign, where your agreement says X, it doesn't say we're going to do Y. It says in that situation, such payment shall be maintained in the collection or distribution account for distribution on the next distribution date. But there's a red flag. It tells you here's a provision. Here's how we are surgically modifying the system to create a different result. What Tilden Park is proposing is something different. Without warning, without a heads up, we put a provision here and it says that if your government agreement says go left, we are now saying go right. And notwithstanding other language that Justice Freeman focused on that seems equally clear in the opposite direction, you should have known that your rights were changing. And of course, uh, none of our clients did. Um, if your honor uh, have any further questions, happy to address them, but- um, I, I just have one question on 306B. Yep. Uh, how do you, what do you say with regard to that section uh, in terms of where it, where the language there differs from uh, governing documents of any of the funds? Um, which I'm um, just- Because for the it, seems, it seems like 306B created a new way of of uh, allocating the shares in reverse order. Not all of the agreements called for that. Am I correct? That's, and those are exactly the agreements that we're talking about. And I do agree that that is the hardest provision to address. And I think that that is a naked provision. And I think the same problem applies to 705. That Tilden Park's argument is, well, you don't have an answer for 306B. I do. I think it serves an important gap filling function for at least 10 trusts and maybe more. 705 is equally clear, has no carve outs, and serves not only a critical function in the agreement, but a critical function in the entire Article 77 process. So I, I concede, and I'm not saying that um, that language is easy, and I think Justice Freeman actually dropped a footnote asking parties to these settlements to please draft more clearly next time. Um, but I do think that the better we, reading We would like agreement... to drop that same footnote. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. I can say I didn't draft it. But um, I, I think it, it is reasonable to say that with the drafting complexities, Justice Friedman read the agreement appropriately and interpreted it appropriately. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Sheaf from Nober Ventures, you have seven minutes. If you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Sorry, Your Honor. Uh, thank you. May it please the court. Uh, unlike my friends, Mr. Grabman and Mr. Reed, I, I would like to start with the text of the PSAs with respect to the Exhibit E issue, uh, and the, sub the subordinate write-up provision. Uh, because, of course, uh, the parole evidence that they focus on is only relevant uh, if there is an Im ambiguity within the four corners of the contract. Uh, the subordinate write-up provision, which is section 6.02H in most of the trusts, is precise and methodical. It says write-ups must start with the subordinate class with the highest priority that has uh, been written down, and then move to the subordinate certificate with the next highest priority on down the line sequentially. Now, appellants argue that the subordinate write-up provision is silent on whether senior certificates may be written up but it speaks loud and clear about which certificates must be written up first. Uh, and I think, Your Honor, that is really the crux uh, of the dispute uh, between the parties, uh, because no one has suggested that uh, there will be sufficient subsequent recoveries in any of these trusts to write up all of the subordinate certificates uh, and, and uh, anything after that. Um, so there's, but there's no way to read this provision to permit the writing of senior certificates before, uh, before the subordinate certificates, given the precision with which it is drafted. And if there was any doubt about what this language means, the PSA for the Balta 2006-3 uh, 
uh, trust uh, clarifies it because that PSA has two provisions governing certificate write-ups. Uh, the first provision, I'm sorry, this is in the record at 7171 uh, to 7173. The first provision is section 6.03B and addresses write-ups of group one certificates and expressly starts with the group one senior certificates. Uh, section 6.04H, in contrast, addresses write-ups for Group 2 and Group 3 certificates and starts with the highest priority subordinate certificate. The Group 2 and Group 3 senior certificates are not mentioned. And this distinction is crystal clear. When the contract intends senior certificates to be written up first, it says so. Now, the only provision uh, that uh, the appellants have uh, raised in an effort to create some sort of ambiguity within the contract itself is the defi can, can definition of real life law. Up to me, please. Wouldn't it be the ordinary course that the senior certificates get written up first? Why do we need that in the agreement? Uh, well, you need it in the agreement in, in order to specify which gets written up uh, um, first or at all, because uh, the the structure how the cash flows uh, are distributed and how certificates are written up are, are all governed uh, by the provisions of the PSA. Uh, this sort of senior subordinate structure that Mr. Reed is focused on is created and defined by that PSA. And you can't, uh, you can't construe that structure without all of the context of the contract language itself. Uh, because these provisions and the, and that structure vary uh, fairly significantly. So, uh, so are you trust. saying that 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 the the governing documents with regard to this issue govern and not the settlement agreement language, unless the settlement agreement language was specific? Uh, yes, Your Honor, uh, we agree with GMO's counsel that. Um, the settlement agreement, as it expressly says, did not intend to amend uh, any of the governing agreements and thus doesn't uh, amend any of those. Agreements. So I, I just want to be clear. So so in other words, uh, notwithstanding some of the statements and provisions in the settlement agreement where the governing documents vary from that, from that order uh, that is suggested in the settlement agreement, the settle the uh, the governing documents control. Is that your position? That that's correct. We we agree with the trial court that um, the settlement agreement terms can be used as a gap filler, but the governing agreement terms control. Got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Connor. You're welcome, Your Honor. Oh. Uh, uh, do you I, still have more? I'm sorry. Did I cut you off? Yes. I. I yeah, go ahead. I, I thought I had more time. Go ahead. OK, thank you. Uh, as I was saying, the only provision in the P in the PSAs that the appellants have pointed to to create some sort of ambiguity is the definition of realized loss. But the realized loss definition does not address certificate write ups at all. Now, certificates are the liability side of the trust that are addressed in the waterfall provisions in Article six. The realized loss definition deals with the asset side of the trust, the loans, and all it says is that the realized loss on a loan, not a certificate, will be reduced to the extent that subsequent recoveries are, quote, applied to reduce the current principal amount of, a, of any class of certificates. Now, a subsequent recovery reduces the current principal amount of a class of certificates when they are paid to that class of certificates, not when they're written up. Uh, this should go without saying, but a write-up increases the current principal amount of a certificate. Uh, the realized loss definition doesn't address which certificates would be paid the subsequent recovery or which certificates are written up. All of that is, is controlled by uh, the waterfall provisions in Article 6, and in particular, the subordinate write-up provision. This is simply a reference to those, those provisions in the waterfall. Um, so because there is no ambiguity or inconsistency in the PSAs on this issue, the court's analysis can stop right there. Uh, appellant's parole evidence cannot alter an unambiguous contract. But I would like to spend uh, a minute uh, on the extrinsic evidence that- Good, and that's all you have it. left, okay? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, they point to monthly remittance reports uh, and Pasha say that these uh, demonstrate a 10-year or 15-year course of performance. They submitted five monthly remittance reports 
uh, from, from five different trusts, five trusts out of 82 with the subordinate writer provision. And all of those reports are from a nine month period in 2018. That is not evidence of a decade long course of performance. Moreover, uh, when these write-ups were apparently done, the trustees were already in court seeking judicial instruction on how to apply this provision. Now, if the trustees themselves are asking if their conduct was correct, it's hardly strong evidence of the intent of all parties. Uh, they also point to three prospective supplements uh, that uh, incorrectly describe uh, the subordinate right of provision in those trust PSAs. But a description of a contract term in a prospectus is only relevant to the extent that the contract itself is unclear. Uh, and because the subordinate write-up provision is crystal clear, the description of those terms in the proceps can't be used to vary them. And even if they could, they would only be relevant to those specific trusts. I I'm sure Mr. Reed and, and Mr. Grabin uh, put their best foot forward in front of Justice Freeman. And so the other 79 trusts that apparently have correct descriptions of the subordinate right of provision can't be overridden by the prospective supplement for a completely different trust. Thank you. Ms. Connor, you, you are last but not least. You have five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Diana Connor, on behalf of the Oliphant Fund respondents. And I'd like to focus on the zero balance certificate issue, the Exhibit G issue. The trial court properly held that zero balance certificates are entitled to both write-ups and distributions relating to the settlement payments at issue here. And critically, that's also consistent with the purpose of the settlement agreement, which was to compensate investors for their prior losses relating to defective mortgage loans. Uh, now, Your Honor, Justice Manzanet, you asked HBK's counsel whether there's any language in the contract that prohibits zero balance certificates from receiving write-ups relating to subsequent recoveries. And HPK's counsel conceded there is not. And in fact, it's the opposite. If you look at section 5.04b, this is the write-up provision that governs who, who receives these subsequent recoveries. And it's allocated based on the certificate's payment priority alone. There's no exception relating to zero balance certificates, no mention of their balances at all. It solely focuses on the payment priority, which is what Justice Friedman noted below. And so it would actually be inconsistent with this provision to read in the limitation that HBK seeks, which is to have it say by payment priority, except for certificates whose balances have reached zero. That's not what the contract says. Tell this me that also, the number of the uh, section you cited earlier, section yes, five, what? 5.04B, and this is on page 3537 of the record. And Critically, HBK's reading would lead to absurd results in this case, where certificates that have been written down to $1 would potentially receive millions from this settlement with JP Morgan, whereas those that had been written down to zero, slightly more, would receive absolutely nothing. That's an absurd outcome, completely inconsistent with the settlement agreement and inconsistent with the, the idea of subsequent recoveries generally, which is that they function as reversals of certificates prior losses. And so there's no reason that certificates, when, when the trust receives these unexpected recoveries in the future, that they shouldn't also be allocated to the zero balance classes. And frankly, no, no certificates need them more than those that have experienced so many losses that they've been written down to zero. Now, HBK says that the retired class provision requires a different result, but that's not the case. Again, Your Honor, Justice Manzanet, you asked HBK's counsel whether that provision says that they're automatically retired. It does not. And in fact, if you read beyond this provision in isolation, there's a provision that HBK did not mention, critically, section 10.02. This is the provision that defines retirement under the contract and explains what it is. And it's a formal multi-step process that requires certificates to be fully paid off and then taken out of circulation. That has not happened here. These certificates are actively traded among investors. They have outstanding losses. The debt has not been repaid. And this is also consistent with the plain meaning of the term retired when you're talking about securities. We cite numerous dictionary definitions on page 14 of our brief. It's commonly understood that when you're talking about just normal bonds, they're not retired until the debt is repaid and then they're taken out of circulation by the issuer. You don't refer to retired bonds when they're outstanding and in the hands of investors with outstanding losses. HBK wants you to read this word in a way that is inconsistent with its plain meaning. And the plain meaning should be this court's touchstone interpreting contract language. And another critical point I'd like to hit is that HBK's reading would render section 10.02 entirely meaningless. 
HBK says that these are just two separate forms of retirement, and you can have automatic retirement under the retired class provision, and then you can have the formal not automatic retirement under 10.02. But that's a fallacy. These cannot coexist because if you read the retired class provision as an automatic retirement provision, that's the only kind you would ever have. Certificates would always be automatically retired first, and you would never even get to the formal uh, 10.02 process. And so under HBK's reading, the parties painstakingly crafted this formal multi-step process for retiring certificates where they're fully paid off and then they're taken out of circulation by the trustee after being physically surrendered at the trustee's corporate offices. That's what's laid out in 10.02. Under HBK's reading, this was all for nothing. They just put this together knowing it would never be used. That's not a reasonable reading of the contract, and it's inconsistent with basic principles of New York contract interpretation law to, to adopt an interpretation that gives an entire provision no meaning at all. So the only way to read these provisions in harmony and to give them both meaning is to recognize that the word retired in the retired class provision is a reference to section 10.02's process. This is the only other provision in the contract that uses that word. And so once the certificates have been fully paid off and taken out of circulation, is when the retired class provision then applies, and then afterwards it says, you know, now that they've been taken out of circulation, they don't get any more distributions. And of course, that's what you would expect when a certificate has been taken off the market entirely. So uh, we ask the court to read the contract as a whole and, and harmonize these provisions and to affirm the trial court's holding that zero balance certificates are entitled to both write-ups and distributions from the settlement payment. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you all. This us. This court now stands in recess. Have a good evening. Thank you, Judge Manzanette.